Thanks, Russ. Welcome to the East Bridgewater School Committee meeting of June 6, 2019. Um, we opened the meeting at 5.30 and went into executive session, so at this time we can continue on with the meeting. Um, we have some retirees here this evening. We have Mrs. Christine Alice and also Mrs. Christine DiLorenzo. Um, Mrs. Alice, she is at the Gordon W. Mitchell School and she's a sixth grade teacher. She's been here from 2004 to 2019 for a total of 15 years. And we have Mrs. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Not, we don't have Mrs. DiLorenzo. We have Lin, Mrs. Linda McStow. I'm so sorry, I was looking at you, thank you. Um, she is with the Central School Teaching Assistant and Administrative Assistant from 1986 to December of 2018. That is a very long time. That's a total of 32 years in this district. Um, we also have some retirees who are not with us this evening. That's Mrs. Christine DiLorenzo, uh, Central School Kindergarten and Second Grade Teacher from 1977 to November of 2018 for a total of 41 years. Mrs. Joanne O'Brien, East Bridgewater Junior Senior High School business teacher from 1994 to 2019, 25 years. And Mrs. Jerry Quigley, Central School Adjustment Counselor from 2008 to 2019 for 11 years. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, we, uh, Too. We appreciate all of the service that you've given to this district and everything that you've done for the kids. And I know that Superintendent Legault and possibly Dr. Williams, they've been with, uh, Dr. Williams has been with you for a long time. Um, and Superintendent Legault probably ha they have things that they would like to say, I'm sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I feel like we've had these opportunities a couple of times and it, um, it's, still shocking to me to think that there's no Linda McStow as part of Central School. Um, the first face that you would always see. I think maybe the parents and the students' very first memory of Central School is, is knowing Mrs. McStow and the fact that they'd be amazed that she knew them before they actually even started at Central School. Uh, they'd come in for their appointment and she'd say, oh, you must be. And they would look at her and watch her. I've been doing things all summer long with your name all over it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I tell the story all the time. I mean, as we worked together uh, for 10 years uh, as I was the building principal, I would text her on the weekends. I'd text her at night because I'd be somewhere and I'd run into someone and I would know the student and I wouldn't know the parent's name and I would text her, who is so-and-so's mom? And she would text right back and tell me exactly who it was. So uh, she, was, uh, she was a gift, you know. Um, to, to not only the students and the parents, but, but the staff members. Um, and I, I know, you know, as great of a job as, as the people that are there are now, uh, you just can't fill Linda McStow's shoes, so. Size <laughs> <laughs> um, So I know she'll be truly missed um, and never be forgotten. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I will add that we will miss you when it comes to dealing with Lucini <laughs> in the fall <laughs> and getting the bus, uh, the bus trips accurate and picking up at the houses and understanding that a kindergartner can't walk that far. And even if we do pick up all of our kindergartens, they still can't walk that far. Um, you've been a champion of all of our students over there. Um, and I think my biggest, uh, my biggest moments are going into that uh, building and sitting there in the chair waiting to go in and see Kate. Um, every student that walked through the door, you knew? And the day I remember the most is that little girl who came in and she said, and you said, right, you lost your tooth. Your mom's on the way. It's going to be okay. We lose them all the time. And, uh, and the little girl went over and she went, and Mrs. McStow went like this. She goes, I can go back. And Mrs. McStow, then go back. And I stood there and I was like, ah, this is her first tooth. I, or, well, um, those are special moments. And, you know, usually moms and dads see those. Uh, and I think Mrs. McStow called that mom and that mom came in and that tooth was given back to that mom. And for me to watch that and to see the care that you've given to all of our children, you are queen and you were queen for the day. You'll always be our queen of Central School. So thank you so much, Mrs. McStow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gentile? I know that he wanted to speak for Mrs. Ailes this evening. It's okay to just 
Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, just to say a couple of words, we uh, had a nice celebration from Mrs. Alice the other day. Um, after uh, having been uh, at the Mitchell School for 12 years, um, I was able to have a lot of opportunities to work with Christine um, around specific student issues, around curriculum, um, working with parents, developing relationships. Um, and when we met with our staff the other day, we talked about some of the things that, that uh, come to mind when I think of Christine and the work that she's done over the years that I've been fortunate enough to work with her. Um, she's an in incredibly empathetic, uh, kind, and dedicated educator. Um, really took time to understand her students, to try and meet their needs, uh, whatever those needs were, whether they were ac of an academic nature or otherwise. Um, and always went above and beyond. As a matter of fact, as recently as today, um, I shared some data with my staff, um, some individual teacher data with the staff, and uh, Christine was one of a few people who has already responded <laughs> with some very thorough and diligent um, uh, input and, and thoughts around uh, her students' data and just student achievement at our school in general. And, um, I think being a few days away from, from your last day at the Mitchell School and to still have that kind of passion and focus just speaks to the person and educator that you are. So on behalf of um, myself, Mrs. Dupre, the staff at the Mitchell School, past co-workers and administrators, thank you for everything. Uh, you've really made a difference in a lot of kids' lives. Wow. delicious items to eat on that table and there's some cupcakes that were specially for you too. If you do you want to address do you want to say anything Mrs. McStow or Mrs. Owls? You don't have to if you don't want to. Oh well, let's see if I can wing something. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I can come right here. Right here? Have a seat. Sure. Have a seat. You've earned it. Hello school committee. Right. Good evening everyone. <laughs> How is everybody? <laughs> Central School? No. Um, I just want to thank the community. I'm probably going to cry now. Um, I feel that I was blessed and privileged to be at that Central School for almost half my life, actually. Um, my children went there. They graduated through East Bridgewater, college, everything. We played sports at East Bridgewater. We did everything. And then it came around again, and I began to see students that they graduated with and their families coming through the Central School. So everything evolved over and over again. But the staff, the principals that I worked with were just amazing people. They're dedicated. Um, they're, co they're compassionate. Um, willing to help out in any way. We were such a great team with George and Gina and Kate and I. That's the part that I miss when I retire is seeing those faces every day. They're like family. And even Liz has come on board and I have enjoyed working with her <laughs> and we've had some funny times together. <laughs> um, short time, but we did have some fun times. But it's just an amazing school to work at. The people there are so dedicated um, and the kids just thrive there. We just have a lot of opportunity for them and everybody is just unbelievably supportive to not only the students but the families as well. And the, fa and the faculty to each other. I've had a lot of fun times. Thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I will miss everyone. Well done. Thank you for taking care of my voice. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you everybody um, first of all I'd like to thank the school committee for giving us this very nice honor to recognize us 
and thank you for all your hard work that you do for our school. You don't have easy jobs, and I know you have to make a lot of difficult decisions, but I know that you're there for the kids, and um, just know that I'm a teacher that does appreciate that you always try your best to do whatever you can, what you're capable of doing, and I know you can't always do what you are, want to do, but I know that you guys usually get the job done as best as you can, and so thank you. And um, I would just like to say again, thank you to Mr. Gentile and Mrs. Dupre and the staff of the middle school. Um, I stood on the shoulders of giants. I came in teaching when I was 40. So um, that's a different experience. And so the people there, the young ones that had already been there for a while and others were so welcoming and so supportive. And I've learned so much from my colleagues. And so to them, I give a big thank you, and um, I wish everybody all the best. Oh, thank congratulations. You. Good luck in your time. So, oh, has everybody that would wanted to sign the clipboard? if they wanted to speak during the public comment section. I'm just going to come and take this before. I'm like choking. No, nobody else wants to sign it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Bear with me while I read my little spiel. Um, <clears throat> So um, there are a large number of members in the public, uh, of the public present this evening. The committee sets aside a time for visitor comments on our agenda. Generally that time does not exceed five to ten minutes, but there, um, I have, so I, that's okay. Um, <clears throat> but there are uh, many members of the public here this evening and I will allocate 20 minutes for visitor comments. There was a sign up sheet at the entrance to the room for members of the public who wish to speak. If you have not signed the sheet, well, I just asked you that. So. Um, <clears throat> I will recognize each member of the public who has signed up to speak in order of the sign up until we have reached 20 minutes. In accordance with school committee, but we have five people, so that will be fine. Um, in accordance with school committee policy, BEDH, public comment at school committee meetings, each person recognized shall have up to two minutes to speak. And Tim McLaughlin will inform the speaker when the speaker has reached one minute and 30, one minute and 30 seconds. That speaker has 30 seconds remaining. No person may speak until recognized by the chair and each speaker must stop at or before two minutes. If the speaker does not end before two minutes, Tim McLaughlin will indicate that the speaker has reached two minutes. In order that all individuals who wish to be heard before the committee have an opportunity to speak and to ensure the ability of the committee to conduct the district's business in an orderly manner and in compliance with the open meeting law, the committee has adopted and will be adhering to the following public comment rules and procedures. One, all individuals who wish to speak during the public comment period must identify themselves by name. Speakers must address the full committee through the chair and may not address individual members of the committee. The public comment period is not an open public forum. Speakers may address topics on the agenda, items specified for public comment or items within the scope of the school committee's responsibility. Each speaker will be afforded the same amount of time to speak. Speakers who exceed their allotted time will be ruled out of order. No individual may speak more than once at a single meeting. Any individual who wishes to address the committee for longer than their allotted time she should submit, submit their comments in writing to the committee either before or after the meeting. Remarks that are discriminatory, profane, vulgar, threatening, or harassing are not permitted. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say welcome everyone. We're, we're glad we have you all in attendance this evening. We don't usually have this many people. We don't even have a quarter of this many people. So I'm happy to see that we have people in the audience. Um, and at this time, I would like to recognize Jonathan Babcock. Would you please come to the microphone to speak and um, please identify yourself? Um, up here. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm here to speak particularly about action item number five on tonight's agenda. Um, quite frankly, I was flabbergasted when I read this action item. 
Um, this pertains to the bylaw amendment that I had uh, petitioned to put on the town warrant, which would require the school committee's approved budget to go before the town for a vote. Um, the town doesn't have to accept it. Um, it would also require that um, the town put together a budget both for the approved school budget and for some, you know, any number that's different that the selectmen choose. Um, again, the town's not required to vote for the approved school budget, but this at least gets our budget number up there. Um, you know, the, the idea is that this would help encourage the town and the schools to work together. As I'm sure you all know, for the last 10 years, the selectmen have not been using our approved number. And last year, we had to actually outvote them to get the approved number up. So I'm shocked to see the way this is phrased. It says that the school committee will vote to state publicly that it does not support petitioned Article 11. Um, first of all, I've never seen an action item phrased this way. It's usually the school committee will vote to support or not support. So I'm just wondering why it was phrased this way and what the school committee's thoughts are on this article. Um, I see no reason the school committee wouldn't vote to endorse this. We can, we're, not, we're not responding. We're, we're listening to people with their public comments, but we're not responding right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, next up, we have Julian Osborne. Please come to the microphone. Uh, okay. Yeah, you can have a seat. <laughs> Welcome. Stand so whatever works for you. Okay. So I'm going to start. Cool. Good evening, everyone. My name is Julian Osborne. I'm a junior here, and I organized today's protest. It was far from perfect, but please don't let the kids just there to skip class overshadow those who were there because they care about their school. Before I start, I'd like to distance myself and the rest of the series protesters from the students who did that. To begin, the biggest issue the protest was held over today was the fact that teachers don't feel as though the administration is listening to them. My, in my conversations with teachers and those of others, it's become clear that they don't feel their opinions are valued when making decisions, of, when making decisions much of the time. Neither I nor any other student has, had, has been able to listen in, to in on every conversation between, student, between teachers and administration individually or as a union. And thus, we don't know the exact details of all the issues that they feel they haven't been heard out on. They've been very professional not going off about that, by the way. Regardless, when the, student, when the teachers' union feels it necessary to have a show of unity in the parking lot before school starts for two Wednesdays in a row now, something is clearly not right. I as, well as many, as the other, I, as well as the other serious protesters today, ask that you work with the union on whatever issues that may arise to an extent that they no longer feel that such shows of union are necessary to gain the administration's attention. Our second issue is, was over the restriction of teachers to one AP class per year. When you see someone like Mr. Siddiqui, our AB and BC calculus teacher, who is honored at the White House as, as Teacher of the Year for Massachusetts, and you look at the average scores his students get on the AP exams, it becomes clear that someone like him is not teaching worse because of the workload that comes with teaching multiple APs. That might not be the case for all teachers, though, and so if a teacher's average score, exam scores aren't satisfactory, it makes sense to maybe limit them to one AP if that is what the issue is. This should be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, though. Sorry. Still good. And not with a blanket rule. Before my two minutes are up, I'd like to say thank you to, the superint to Superintendent Legault for acknowledging the students' First Amendment right to protest, and to the workers from the police department and fire department who were there making sure everyone was safe today. I've sent out a letter to, or I will be sending out a letter to the superintendent and assistant superintendent going further into detail about various issues, and I'd love to speak with you in person sometime soon. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for speed reading that you put it all in the allotted time. That's great. Um, we have Nicole. Um, I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, Muncie. I don't know. What is it? Muncie. Muncie. Sorry about that. Um, please come up to the mic. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, um, Nicole Muncie. I'm a parent. Um, I have a junior and a sophomore currently in the school. I have. My daughter graduates class of 2018. I came requesting information about the curriculum pertaining to the AP courses and the rumor of the eight scheduled class blocks that didn't seem to make a lot of sense to anyone. 
that I'm aware of. I don't know if it's just a rumor. I also like to say Mr. Dickey is more than capable of teaching more than one AP class. My daughter received a five in her calculus exam. She also received a five in the um, A push exam. So whatever these teachers are doing are appropriate. I don't think that the children should be fit into a box and taught that way. I think they should be individually taught and not just put square into a box of what you guys decide to do. Thank you. Thank you. No, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Um, next up, we have Mr. Kurt Shippey. Welcome. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm here at the request of my colleagues um, to help and try and clear the air a little bit and some of our concerns about proposed schedule changes. Uh, I'm going to read from you a letter that uh, a committee of us put together uh, back in May. And it, it articulates some of our concerns. Um, the context is uh, that our teachers had just visited West Bridgewater. Uh, educators at the East Bridgewater Junior Senior High School visited West Bridgewater Middle Senior High School to study how to implement their schedule. They were excited about the educational opportunities that school provides for students. However, we have serious concerns about our ability to effectively implement this schedule at East Bridgewater Junior Senior High School next year. Some of these concerns are due to the nature of the schedule itself. Others are related to the timeline we currently face. We offer this communication in a collaborative spirit and with a focus on what is best for our students. One significant concern regarding the current proposed schedule is loss of instructional time. One minute. In the proposed schedule, students would meet for um, 1,685 minutes less or 30 55 minute less sessions given the rigors of curriculum, the demands of high stakes testing, and the growing research questioning the efficacy of homework, we believe the loss of instructional time will negatively impact student learning. Educators were also apprehensive about the every other day schedule, hindering our ability to create routines, build a cohesive classroom culture, and provide constant exposure to concepts, especially for our building's younger students. Aside from the concerns surrounding instructional timing, we were also worried the schedule may overload students without proper planning on our part. As we rightfully encourage our students to take increasingly vigorous course loads while also helping them maintain a healthy social emotional balance, we worry students will become overwhelmed under the proposed schedule. Two minutes. We recognize that it is developmentally appropriate to ask students to adapt to new educational settings, but it is important that we have time to build, uh, as a building, to plan how we will scaffold any major schedule changes for our students. Without carefully planning, we risk leaving students with the shell of West Bridgewater's schedule without delivering the substance. Educators in the building are excited about some of the strengths of the schedule. For example, limiting transition times during the day would be effective. Longer blocks could be helpful in many classes, particularly science labs. Our concerns, however, are significant enough to warrant discussion of a pause in the process. Many teachers who visited West Bridgewater were impressed with their school, but it was not simply because of the way they organized minutes in their day. Their school benefited from full staffing, a long period of administrative continuity, and generally a more cohesive environment than we currently enjoy. It's the EBA's position that our students would greatly benefit from a period of continuity in which we could build a stronger school culture to making any sweeping changes. This time could be utilized to study options for the future, determine what will best fit our school's needs, and plan for a strong implementation. Respectfully, Kurt Shippey, representing the EBEA. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Jamil Siddiqui. Welcome. 
Please come to the mic. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Jamil Siddiqui, 293 Washington Street, East Bridgewater, uh, Massachusetts. Um, I'm the longest tenured faculty member here at the junior high school, serving in my role as mathematics teachers for the last 25 years. And I also happen to be the 2019 Massachusetts State Teacher of the Year. I'm here today speaking on behalf of my colleagues, many of which you see here with me tonight. On May 10th, the East Bridgewater Education Association sent the letter that President Shippey just read to you, requesting a meeting to discuss some of the potential difficulties that we saw in moving to a new schedule during the 2019 and 2020 school year. The faculty was hoping to sit down with our administration and discuss the points that we felt would impact our students. I am disappointed to say in the almost month that has passed since delivering our request, we have never been acknowledged. We have been completely ignored. This is disappointing. This is disappointing because I feel that our input is not valued. This is disappointing because we feel disrespected. This is disappointing because we believe that rushing into a new schedule, a schedule that was suggested by an administrator is no longer even here and one that does not have the supports in place at this time in order for it to be effective is problematic at best and detrimental to our students at worst. We are here tonight to say again what we stated in our letter. We would like to open a meaningful discussion with administration about the concerns we have rushing into a new schedule without properly assessing the effects it will have on our students' educations. <coughs> My colleagues and I are professionals. We are very good at what we do, and we've been a source of pride for this district for a very long time. All of us want to see our students succeed. Our concerns, our concerns should not be ignored and treated as if they're insignificant. As the people who work hard for and directly with the children of East Bridgewater, our opinion should be valued and we should be given the respect that we deserve. 130. We sincerely hope that you as a school committee feel the same way we do. Thank you. Thank you. So that was the last person on the list of people that wanted to speak during the com public comment section. And now um, we will move on to, uh, we have the student here from Student Advisory Council, that's Delaney Lyons. And before she comes up to speak, I would like to thank people for coming and speaking this evening because it's important that people hear what you have to say. Thank you. Welcome, Delaney. Hi. Hi, Delaney. Delaney. Um, so this is actually um, the time slot for Senate, which is usually calendar updates. So recently, we all clubs have reelected new presidents, treasurers, secretaries, vice presidents, etc. So we congratulate all those students, and I know a lot of them are willing to work hard. And I just want to thank not only our Senate advisor, Mr. Siddiqui, for working hard, and um, I know this year was wicked busy for him, but every day he was there with Senate every Wednesday, but anytime we had a question, he was there. But not only him, but all the teacher advisors who were there advising other clubs after school with students, using their own time um, to keep Student Senate running so we can keep events going for students. Um, there's not much other to say because it's mainly a calendar thing. It's the end of the year, so we just congratulate everybody and thank everybody who worked hard this year. That's about all. Thank you. Thank you, Delaney. I would just like to point out, I think Delaney's here and Riley Costello, I got your name right, and I'm not sure if there's anyone else here from the undergrad um, recital that was the other night. You guys, awesome playing the piano, Riley, and Delaney, you have a beautiful voice, and I don't know if I missed anybody. If it, um, I saw Alex, you did a great job too. I don't know if I, I don't know, I hope I'm not missing anybody, but everybody did a great job. Um, and next up, we have the superintendent's corner. Thank you. So you, you asked for an update on the, the schedule. Um, so I'm going to ask Mrs. Noyes, the assistant principal of the junior senior high school, uh, Mrs. Clifford to come up, uh, Mr. Uh, Fallon to come up as special ed director, and, and Dr. Williams will run this conversation. Um, the, the bell schedule. Uh, I, think, I think Mrs. Noyes has brought copies for everybody or some copies to be passed out or to give out. But Mrs. Noyes is going to talk to it because 
as the high school that's the junior senior high school 7 through 12 it's their model that they have come up with and she'll be discussing it this noise come on up it is now Hi. welcome Bring up a couple of chairs we need to Just one, one of these. Welcome, Mr. Hello. These. Welcome, Mr. Phelan. Good evening. Miss Noise, I don't want to forget her. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Um, going around, Mr. Leonard has handed out some of the um, blue and purple sheets that are our presented schedule for this time. Um, we did send 21 teachers to West Bridgewater. This schedule is also used at Plymouth North High School. We had to adapt it a little bit because our day is actually 15 minutes shorter than um, the other schools. So these blocks of time have been presented according to the time that we have here at the high school. This is a four-day schedule with a rotating block, which we listened to our teachers because the other schools um, had wanted, or they use a stagnant schedule, so they don't rotate at all. So one of the concerns from our staff was that they wanted the periods to rotate. Each student will have four blocks in one day. They will average about 77 minutes a piece. There is a 10 minute break in which both schools in which that we talked to felt that it was extremely important for them to have this as well as the teachers with teaching such a long block. The 10 minute break basically would be a time for students to have a snack, to get some water, go to the bathroom, chat with their friends, just take a little breather um, before the next class began. Then during the B block would happen, then we would have what we call our power block. This is a 30 minute block that would take a variety of different uses. One would be similar to what we have right now as a directed learning time. This would be a time for students to go find their teachers that may need some makeup work um, or need a little extra help or question on a homework that they have been given from the previous night. If a student was out on one day and they come into school the next day, this is an opportunity for them to check in with their teachers and get all of the work that they missed from the day before. We will also plan on using this power block for assemblies, for scheduling, for guidance programs. This is also going to be used as an advisory. The details are still going to obviously be have, have to be worked out over the summer with this time. For our special ed students, this would be time for um, extra resource, extra pullout time for them to get their services met that they may need as well. From there, we would go into our lunch block, still sticking to exactly the same lunches that we have, 20 minute lunches. Seniors would have first lunch because it would become a senior privilege that they could combine their power block with their lunch block to go off campus and have a 50 minute lunch um, to or go to the library or we'd like to start using the courtyard a lot more and that would give them an extra time to kind of have that freedom as young adults to make some good choices and do what they need to get done and then the last period is a little bit longer because we scheduled in four minutes for afternoon announcements. The next day would be the following four classes and then back to the rotating of the uh, C, D, A, B. So students would be um, in different directions. Some of the benefits uh, Ms. Clifford is going to share with you. There is scheduled time in there. The passing time is four minutes between each class three minutes in between each lunch. The 10 minute break, there is no passing time from that, so whatever the students have for block A, 
they will keep their stuff there, go for their break when the bell rings, then they would pick up their stuff and proceed to the next class. Ms. Clifford will share um, what we feel are the benefits to the schedule. Mm -hmm. So the reason that this schedule was chosen, I know personally I've been at East Bridgewater Public Schools for seven years now. This is a discussion that's been ongoing for almost that whole time. It has gotten serious and then not serious and followed through and, and dropped about changing the schedule to accommodate a 7 through 12 schedule. So the first year I was here, that was a director from the superintendent. It was not explored to fruition. There was another couple of years later, there was several groups of us that went out to explore different 7 through 12 buildings. We discussed different schedule options. That did not come to pass. After the NIAS self-study and the report that we received back, the schedule that we currently have does not fully service 7 through 12 in any effective manner. What will come from this is that we will have increased electives for students that are very, sometimes very limited with their five majors in six classes. It will eliminate directed learnings and allow us to have the opportunity to do an AP academic lab for students that are taking more than two AP courses as well as it will allow us to direct skill intervention blocks within the power block for special ed and general ed students that are struggling in specific areas. It allows us to have stronger access to cooperative, or students to have stronger access to cooperative and experiential learning opportunities, reduces lecture style instruction. It's gonna help us work towards the vision of the graduate, which was a handout that Ms. Noyes passed out, which is also part of the NIAS self-study and report that we will have to report on again in October, I believe. Mm -hmm. It increases opportunities for career pathway development for students and eventual internships, which we're hoping to do second semester. It will create stronger relationships between teachers and students because they have less classes to teach. They'll spend more time with students and be able to develop stronger relationships. Students will benefit from a multitude of instructional strategies to increase learning and demonstrate knowledge. There'll be less movement in the hallways, which the other schools reported decreased disciplinary issues. And students have expressed a desire to have support opportunities on social emotional topics. Different groups that students have started around, around the building, they would have this opportunity to run those groups during the power block. So one of the um, one of the great things, one of the couple of the programs that they ran for Power Block was like a girls walk and talk group, um, a quick, healthy um, s snack class. So these were during the Power Blocks. Sometimes the different creativity that the other schools had used, um, working on stress management, meditation, mindfulness, all these topics that are so need you know widely used today that our school really needs to move forward on. Um, so the power block is definitely something that can provide a lot of opportunities for a lot of different things for students. I mean, I just think that, that looking at the, at the schedule the way it is in the power block, um, it allows an opportunity to give students who have disabilities a chance to get in and get the resources that they need, get those interventions that they need, work with them and support them. Um, it, it really is beneficial to them, as well as having some longer periods or longer blocks allow them, allow us as educators to get out and use the UDLs that the whole district's been working on, develop that, get that across out there, and really support all learners. I know just recently interviewing some candidates for our science position, um, most of the candidates are now teaching in block scheduling. So it is extremely uh, popular with a lot of schools around us. And I know it's a fast, quick change for some people, but from what I've heard, the schedule has been talked about um, throughout the years. And so I think it's extremely beneficial for our students, especially trying to move towards career pathways and having internships, this gives a student the ability to have 81 minutes at the end of the day to go to the hospital, work as a candy striper there, mechanics, carpentry, whatever they choose um, for their career that they may want to go into for school or something like that. So I think it's very beneficial there as well. Can I ask just a quick question about that? Would, would they miss these classes? 
It would only like, it would depend on their internship. So in other words, if you're going on it, like I know I don't know how to make it work, but, but like I assume it wouldn't be an everyday internship because you couldn't miss four classes right. a week, right? So, so how would that work? So the game plan would be to it would be a semester thing. So it would be like the last semester of the school year for seniors. Oh, so this is only for seniors. I'm sorry. That yeah, means yeah. Okay. So this internship would be for seniors. If I didn't clarify, sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, and then we would schedule it in for the second half of the year if they were interested in doing that internship. And that block would be their internship block. So they wouldn't miss a class because it would be scheduled that way. Correct. <clears throat> oh, so, wait a minute, but, so but it the could block be one, rotate. It, but it's an internship, so it could just be one block per, per, per cycle. cycle. So just one day they would leave when it's at it the end. <clears throat> one day internship. Okay, that might Makes sense to me. As so, a pilot, I mean, we have to start somewhere. Can I ask a couple questions about Power Block? Because I would suspect that when, when that number is referenced of 1685 minutes less per year of instruction, the bulk of that, what they're referencing comes from the Power Block time. And um, working in a school that has Power Block, I, I think very highly of it, but I'm curious about your plans for it at this school. So you've talked about support for AP kids. You've talked about support for kids that have IEPs more than half of our kids do not have IEPs or take AP classes. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be the plan for those kids during these power block classes? So it would be the same thing. They would have similar directed learning, what they have right now. Um, we, we really would like them to go out to whatever s subject that they are struggling in and go see that teacher for whatever makeup work that they could get done or if they're having an issue with a certain lesson that was taught the day before, they would go and talk with that teacher. So, so they, they would all they, be scheduled decide, as a homeroom. So they, they can okay. do what they want. Yeah. So they have a place to report to during they have, that They period. are scheduled yes. as a homeroom there, yes. So I'm Tim McLaughlin, a mid-B student who you know gets pretty good grades, but nothing spectacular. And I'm caught up in most of my work, and there's nothing outstanding. What am I doing on, on that block? So the teacher would hopefully be instructing some reading or you know just personal reading, taking notes for future classes, like getting, getting ahead of the game. And the teacher that's in that class at the time who may be seeing other kids who are struggling during their other periods yep. is focusing on those kids, but not necessarily the 12 or 13 kids that may be left behind in their class. So I guess, so, you, so, so, so you, your teacher is going to have 25 kids in their class, mm -hmm. but they're, they're focusing on 10 kids that need intervention at the minute, mm -hmm. and there's a group of the kids that are... The other students should be doing their homework. Self-directed. Yes, yeah, self-directed. But what if they don't have homework? Well, then hopefully they have a book or something else that they I, can be doing. I only ask because you're referencing lower discipline by the less transitions, which I agree with, but I see a potential... And, and, and I. Again, I've seen other schools how they handle this, but I want to know what your plans are. I see a potential for huge discipline issues by kids that are not directed or... What happens in West Bridgewater? Um, they, they are... Well, the, in my school, they're assigned to homerooms, and they are with those homerooms unless a teacher agrees to take them, and there's a plan for those kids. So it, it's, it's something they've done for 15 years mm -hmm. where it, work? the, it works. Yeah. But I, I don't know how it worked when it was rolled out, and I don't know how they came to this current... So I think what Version. Ms. Noy said is that would be fully developed over the summer, but our tentative plans at this point would be to have teacher permission to leave that like home. Like a pass. Room. They would have That would also pass. be an opportunity for guidance to do presentations on social and emotional. So if a teacher had a full day that they anticipated a bunch of students coming in, they could easily call guidance and we could go in and work with the other half of the students to create direction or a lesson. But we only have four guidance counselors. And I have and interns and myself in this. Okay. For those, those um, higher achieving students who are on the younger end, not in AP classes, very diligent, um, to your point, caught up with their work, having this power block, speaking somewhat from experience, um, there would be great opportunity for much boredom for a child who may already be a little bored in school. How is that going to be addressed? Because you're, like Tim said, you're addressing AP, you're addressing the kids who need extra help, but you do still have a good amount of kids who are strong performers, but I guess are on a little bit different part of this. And to know that a kid perhaps is sitting in this power block reading every day, 
you know, I'm sure they'll have homework, but some kids like to do their homework at home or what have you. I just, I would like to, to understand a little more thought around that because I'm sure the responsibility shouldn't fall on the teachers all the time to make sure these kids, you know, are doing reading or what have you. Mm -hmm. Can I add So right now within the schedule, we have directed learnings. So like a study hall, students are in a room, they could all be working on something totally different. With, the pl with this schedule, the power block is going on at the same time for everyone across the building. So it does allow for opportunities for teachers to um, have an interest in uh, conducting an enrichment group or in, in conducting uh, a student support group around a particular topic. So with this type of schedule, it allows us to create those opportunities knowing that we have all staff and all students available and it's not a matter of kids a hit or miss as to whether the teacher they need to be with is available or not. So this consistent power block across the time of day, now we can customize what the students are, are doing as opposed to a directed learning right now where you may need extra support or you, you need to go beyond what you're learning in a classroom and you can access that teacher or that teacher can pull a group of, of students. I mean, working collaboratively across the building gives the opportunity that we can sort students into groups based on what they need on any particular day. And it doesn't have to be every single Monday, it's this, every single Tuesday. It has the flexibility to be altered uh, given activities and events that are going on at any point in the year. Okay, so to that point, understanding that it's a consistent power block and it's, it's a collaborative, and it, there'll be opportunity for all students depending on where they fall or what their needs are or what's planned. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking in my head, I'm such a planner. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, how, how is this actually going to be planned out? You said it can change, right? Depending on the day or the needs or the events. I'm just thinking in my mind, you have all these kids, the teachers all available. How logistically can that be managed, perhaps, if it's done on a Monday? It's right. kind of like a moving target, so, right? Just real quick, how many kids are we talking about? If we're, if we're talking about planning and logistics, how many kids are we, are we talking about? Well, the whole school would have power block at the same time. So, I mean, it can roll out as, as slowly or as quickly as we want it to. So every student is assigned somewhere initially. So as things are developed, then it could be an opportunity for students to, oh, I'm gonna, I would like to go here for that block as opposed. And I know with West Bridgewater, they're still reporting to that teacher they're assigned to, to then let them know where they want to spend that time. There's a whole setup for it. Right. Right. I, I guess my only point in bringing it up is I, I actually support the power block. I think it's a great idea. I think uh, intervention blocks are, you know, really what moves schools forward. I just want to make sure that that's where I've kind of seen these things fall apart before mm -hmm. is that you spend so much time thinking about the kids in AP or the kids that need, you know, IEP support and you leave out the 60% in the middle and that's where it crumbles mm -hmm. is that those kids, there's not a plan and there's not a, a, a setup for them. And, and that I want to make sure there's thought a lot of thought that goes into that. Yeah, and I think um, moving forward, you know, one of the things that we had thought about was the getting together, creating a master schedule before school starts next year uh, with the ideas and dates of when we would have assemblies, when we would have the, the power block that the students would be using as their study time. Um, it, it is going to take a lot of work. And we are going to have growing pains. We are going to, you know, it's going to be a time of learning for the first term or so, just as West Bridgewater, just as any school, when you unroll a new schedule out, there are going to be things that may work for other schools that don't work for us or vice versa. And we have to, you know, adjust that as we go along. Can I ask, well, I have multiple questions, but seventh and eighth graders mm -hmm. currently have six courses, mm -hmm. including specials. Mm -hmm. So on the seven block, existing seven block schedule, and let me first preface this by this, is that theoretically, I think the schedule is awesome. I'm more concerned that we're implementing it too fast. And, and here's one of the reasons. So we are adding an eighth block to seventh and eighth grade students, but we're not adding any electives, we're not adding any teachers or anything to that. So in effect, they end up in two enrichments, which I don't totally understand enrichment because my daughter doesn't have one this year. Um, 
But I, I see the potential for a lot of unengaged board seventh and eighth graders if they're having two enrichments. I know they're not two in the same day, but two enrichments in their eight block. Unless, and again, unless we have like really structured in enrichments and how do we get all of that from June to September when teachers aren't even in the building? I think for seventh and eighth grade that are already running an enrichment program, the additional enrichment for seventh grade is gonna be a skills academy. So they're gonna be focusing focusing on executive functioning skills by term. So the students will rotate and they'll go through organization and prioritization and all the, the different things that I've spoken to you every time I come into my presentation. That's a real need for it's social emotional. Need. So that's what they are going, that's and what their plan is. And who will be teaching is, that? The seventh grade teachers. And guidance will be going in and co-teaching with them. But are they trained to do that? Real, I'm sorry, just real quick. Are we, are we talking about a situation where we, have, where we think that there is no um, boredom block, if we're going to call it that, um, and now we're going to create a boredom block. That's part, part so of my. So it's not sorry, happening. It? But it's not. You don't think that it is happening, and we're going to create that. No, I'm saying it probably is already happening with one, and now we're adding two. We're going to add two. I don't believe that it's happening. Is that? Well, I don't mean think, in do totality, that but you, you know. You think that's going to be the outcome? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the professionals. Do we think that's going to happen? No. No. I think that the seventh grade teachers have put a lot of thought into their additional class. I think that they know the students very well, and I think that they're addressing So they already know they have the additional class? Yes. <laughs> the seventh grade teachers are the ones that develop it. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 again, I think the Do we idea have a of the schedule grade is phenomenal. Do you say that they don't know it? Get out of here. I just. Don't let that happen. How long have other districts, if anybody knows, from the time of drawing a block to implementation, how long has the plan been? And I mean, honestly, my biggest concern is we're gonna get into it and realize we don't have enough money to support it, so. Well, the, the year has to start with every student being scheduled. So we right. wouldn't have students not scheduled within the building. No, no, I know so they don't change scheduled, your master schedule mid-year. Like you, right, right. So I'm not implying that, I'm saying. Oh, good. Why, why September of 19 instead of September 20? to make sure we do it right and get it right. And I don't know the answer to the well, question. What's the benefit? Asking, what's the, tell me what's the benefit so, is. So, so if I can right. Well, okay, well, okay, of course. Make and not having it, it right, but tell me how we're gonna get it right. Let Dr. Williams speak for a minute, thanks. Sorry. So as far as, from a, a central office perspective, it's not our role to develop a schedule. What our responsibility is to make sure that the district initiatives can be best implemented through the schedules that are developed within each building. Two major initiatives that we've been working on um, for the past couple of years that I've shared with you numerous amount of time is universal design for learning. Mm -hmm. We've invested um, quite a bit of money in having three teams of teachers go to multiple trainings over the course of the year um, so that they can learn uh, what is universal design for learning and basically it's to uh, prevent barriers from students being able to access education. It's really looking at how to uh, instruct students so that they're engaged uh, and that they can uh, represent what they know in the modes that fit them best. So have they, have, they have choices in how um, they are learning information and they have choices in how they're representing what they've learned. Um, and, and for those that are on the teams that are here tonight, um, we spoke to Dr. Katie Novak, who um, is the guru, and she said to us, you cannot effectively run universal design for learning without the blocks. You need those longer blocks in order to be able to effectively implement the universal design for learning strategies. So for me, that was one thing. We're investing our time, we're investing our money, it's not going away, we've got new teams that are gonna start the trainings next year. So for, for us to wait another year, and, and to Mr. McLaughlin's point, we wouldn't implement or change in the middle of the year. That to me is a year lost of learning, or a, a, an opportunity for students to access uh, their education and to break down the barriers. I'm a parent with three students that are gonna be in this building next year. For me, it's a year loss for them. One less year of them being able to access the education and show what they know and express what they've learned in the mode that works best for them. So yes, we could wait, but we have to think about the students that are losing out on that opportunity to do that. The other big piece for me that we've talked about is uh, the MAP assessment. 
We've spent the last two years with data teams in all three buildings, um, and we just met Tuesday to look at the data. And th the difference in the growth at the elementary school was profound. And to me, the biggest driving factor was having intervention, deliberately being able to look at the data, analyze the data, and provide the support to students explicitly in the skills that they're deficit. And how do they do that? They do it during intervention blocks. The high school does not have that ability right now. We talked a little bit earlier in the year about having late starts so that they could have more time to look at the data. I'll be back to you with that next year. We definitely want to implement that for the, the high school to have time to sit uh, to look at the data because we need to use the data to make decisions. I know in speaking with one of the high school teachers yesterday, uh, they had uh, MCAS uh, prep that was specifically looking at how students performed the year before and helping to support them in the areas of deficit so that they'd perform better the following year. This type of a schedule would allow for us to do that. And they could keep changing. Every six to eight weeks, there could be a different intervention group focused on a different set of skills. And in my mind, if we can do that for those students that need intervention, we can certainly create these opportunities for students who need enrichment. That there isn't always an ability and opportunity to do in a typical class. Um, so for me, those were two huge pieces, the universal design for learning and the opportunity to use the data to perform intervention for those students explicitly. And I know that we had team one, and I know Liz is going to talk about it later in the high school principal interviews, but is there any concern not that a principal is walking into a change that they've had no play or say in, and or are they, a, I assume we have operating in full disclosure? Because we don't have a principal, so I, that, I mean, that's my other concern. We don't have a principal in place. And while I do think this is an excellent schedule, if the principal is responsible for the schedule and not the administration, are we implementing a change for a principal that isn't even here? So even if we kept the schedule, that might be a change for somebody coming in. We don't know what schedule they're used to, so if we kept the schedule we have for an administrator, it would be new to them. Uh, Mr. McLaughlin was part of the interviews, that's later in the agenda, but with every candidate we interviewed, uh, not one of them asked what the schedule was. So I think from an, administ an administrator's perspective, uh, that's not a priority. And just a quick point, too, that any principal that we hire is going to walk into a schedule, that whether it's this schedule or another right, schedule. Right, but we're talking so about a schedule saying, change. Uh, no, we're not talking, we're just saying that whatever schedule it is, a principal is going to walk in and say, we're going to say this is the schedule. So it's... Whatever schedule we decide. But we're in mid-change and you're asking a principal to implement something that they had no involvement in. That's my point. And they, they will know about that before. Well, that's what I'm asking. As they're walking in the door. There won't be a secret. So, Superintendent Lugo, if I, if I could. Um, so it seems there's basically two discussions going on here right now. One is, is it a good schedule or not? And the other is, how it was communicated and come about. Um, from my own perspective, I... I I do like the schedule a lot. I, I mean, I work in a district that uses the schedule. We're a high achieving district. There's a lot to like about it. I understand the frustration and concern on behalf of the teachers, having been a teacher that went through master schedule changes and having designed master schedule changes myself. I've never worked or heard of a school that did a master schedule change and said, fantastic. Mm -hmm. There's, it's natural for them to be frustrated about it. I, I do want to address the, the communication and collaboration piece a little bit, and I'm wondering if, the appropriate venue to do that. And I know we had, I believe we had a parent night earlier in the spring about the schedule, correct? Was it Poorly attended, if I remember. We had some kind of an event. No? Am I misremembering that? Am I misremembering that? I apologize. Perhaps, I apologize. I'm misremembering that. Perhaps we could, though. Um, so I'm wondering if at this time, having a, an open forum for parents uh, and, and the community to come together. I'm a parent that I am in no way qualified to. Not, not to speak to it, to ask questions of the, exist, of the current administration and, and to sure. understand better what it is we're trying to achieve here, because... Sure. But, no. Can't take them mm -mm. Mm -mm. but there's many in the community that aren't just you. I understand that, but I feel that, you know, we've fielded calls from people that weren't able to make it here tonight, I'm, and... Just for the record, I'm also not qualified to, to determine, like, yeah. fire department. No nope. procedures, or and don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not. I'm not asking. You're, you're, I'm not asking that we. His point. 
I'm not asking that we make changes to the schedule. I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating for an event where Dr. Legault and Ms. Noyes can get up in front of the town, similar to what we're doing now, but not in the school committee forum, and have a conversation about the schedule and what it means for our kids and what the timeline is and what's realistic. I don't know that waiting a year is a good idea. I, I agree. I understand that September is quick. There's no middle ground between those two. And I think there's always a reason to wait another year. So th all those things being said, I mean, this is ultimately the decision of the superintendent and the administration on the schedule they're going to move forward with. So that being said, I think you know, communication with the town should be the, of the utmost concern right now. Mm -hmm. and, and the staff. Correct. I, I include the staff as part of the town. Sure. Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's definitely I'm open to having an open forum or talking to parents the best that we can with the information that we have. Do I feel that the schedule and the details of it still need to be figured out? Absolutely. Um, running on one person being in the offices, um, I have not been able to delve into the details that we needed to do that because there are many other things that also take precedence in the school, the safety of our children being number one. Um, so there is still a lot of work to be done with this schedule. Do I feel like for the rigor and for in-depth learning that this is the way to go? I do truly believe that. And I think it has a lot of um, potential to offer our students a college-like feel. Um, having in college, for those that are heading that way, in college we take classes every other day, a Monday, Tuesday, or I mean a Monday, Wednesday, or a Tuesday, Thursday class. This is exactly what the schedule starts to train them for moving um, towards the college track if that's what they choose. If they don't choose the college track, it gives them time to learn the lesson, have the day in between to digest the material, get the help that they want, and then move forward to the next day in that lesson as well. So I am, I am willing to talk with whoever would like to talk with me um, about that with Ms. Clifford and sure. Superintendent Legault, Dr. Williams, um, if they're interested. But Yes, I will. I'm open to talk to whoever would like to speak. Great. And I just want to um, make one quick point to you, Dr. Williams, and that's the first time I've called you doctor. Um, the, the power block, when you just were re-clarifying the use of MAPS testing, that's encouraging for me to hear because I see this, this data coming home all the time, and I'm always wondering where is the opportunity for the teachers to actually use this in a collaborative format to plan for kids who are in all different areas of whatever the subject matter is. So uh, that, that was helpful clarification, and I hope it helped other parents understand that it's not necessarily just going to be, you, you know, sitting, reading, because that's somewhat what I kind of had, right. depending because, on where your kid is academically. Right, because we do, the map testing will even show that we do have students who are high performing yet their growth is not there. So, you know, to, to speak to those students who may not uh, need intervention to um, mediate deficits, it's also for those students who are strong academic students, but yet we're not seeing the growth. I, I think in some ways, Terry, you can, uh, or at least supported why I think there's some benefit to waiting because you are only one right now, and we're going into summer break, and we, we have even less. Again, I think the schedule is great, but I think, I, kn I know for my own student, I'm, I'm not gonna speak for other parents, but I know for mine there's a lot of anxiety around it, not knowing what next year is gonna bring. Um, so I, I, again, I, I, I think the schedule is great. I think implementing it well and making sure we have everything we need to implement it well, including funding which that is it's definitely a concern of our staff. Um, you know, with longer blocks, they need more things, and we want to offer electives. We want to offer longer labs in science, foreign language lab. All those things are going to take funding. And we, as an administrative team, would definitely have to work on that and look at those things that 
you know, if we are asking our staff to do this, that we support the extras that they need. But, as a, but there's as a no team, funding in our budget, right? As a team, you think that financially, academically, student achievement wise, that this is the right way to go. Basically, I'm looking to ask you, do you have a recommendation? You think this is the, this, you think that this is the way to go? Yes, is that, I do. Is that true? Yes. Is that? Mm -hmm. Do you yes. think the timing is the way to go? I don't you think know, anything, you know anybody would disagree on the value of the schedule. I think it's a phenomenal schedule. I think, do we rip off the Band-Aid, go into it, fix it so that we make it work, whether we do it this year or whether we do it next year, we're going to stumble, we're going to have our issues, we're, you know, we're, that's going to set us back another year, kind of like what Dr. Williams said. And we will be I, here to point all of those out for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks. But I also understand the concern, and it, I think it will work as we far, you know, work. we have to work together. Thank you. Thank you. thank you. I would like to say thank you to Ms. Noyes and Mr. Phelan and Mrs. Clifford for ex that in this explanation. Well done. Thank you for coming. Thank I know it's a hot seat. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Dr. Noyes and Mr. Lago for explaining. And we look forward to future public discussions. Um, and at this time, we're going to move forward to the next item on the agenda. So you have the NEASC update in front of you. Um, we just received this on June 4th, which was Monday. Uh, they sent me correspondence. Um, the committee was pleased to learn of the following development of the vision of the graduate, the initial system to measure and, and report student progress on achieving the vision of the graduate, the efforts to examine how the school is effectively supporting the needs of staff and students through the district's PD Academy. The increased funding for novels for the English department, equipment for the science department, resources for the library, supplies for the wood shop and technology education programs, new uniforms for the marching band and math department supplies and activities. In addition to responding to the 11 recommendations highlighted in the committee's July 23rd to 18 notification letter, the, school, the school's two-year progress report due October 1st, 2020 should provide detailed information and action taken to address the additional highlighted recommendations. These additional recommendations are provide an update on the status of implementation of the process to assess the vision of the graduate. Develop a plan to ensure opportunities for all students to practice and achieve the vision of the graduate. Provide an update of the community and district's governing body funding for staffing, necessary supplies and materials and technology repairs and replacement. Now, of course, this was done by, this, by the teachers, faculty, staff, and uh, former principal. And uh, I did speak to Kathleen, Dr. Kathleen Montana, uh, Montanagno the other day. Actually, I, I spoke to her first. Uh, I had to leave for a meeting. Dr. Uh, uh, William spoke to her, uh, secondly, told her we are in the process of hiring a new high school, junior senior high school principal. At that time, the junior high school principal uh, would meet with the NES accreditation, um, our, their liaison, to sit down and talk to them about the, the visit, uh, the next steps into moving forward. This is what I have. This is the update. I also spoke... Um with Kathleen, myself, the other day to introduce myself and um, kind of went over a few things. So I will be looking at the um, reports and moving forward, trying to get that done with uh, hopefully some support of the staff that was already on the NEAS committee to make that happen for October 10. Liz, can we get a copy of what we sent to them to sure. trigger this letter? I've asked for um, a, a copy from her office. Easy. Yep, sure. Um, the junior senior high school principal search update, as you know, I am removed from the process in the first round of interviews, the second, and then it, it, uh, the, any interviews done by the, by the administration team is, is put to my office for recommendation to appointment to you. The principal uh, search committee uh, was started by Dr. Williams, um, so I'm going to Again, hand it over to Dr. Williams, we'll let you know the timeline that's coming up. And we are, gonna, so we are uh, looking at a different type of format coming up over the next couple of weeks, or next week, um, that we spoke a little bit about. And, uh, but Dr. Williams can give you an update of where they are at this time. Great, thank you. Um, so we had 27 um, candidates apply for the position of a junior senior high school principal. Those applications were screened down to 12 based on the qualifications needed. Um, for the high school principal position. 
of the 12 um, that was pared down to eight um, based on information within the resume that we felt uh, did not qualify them as a, a, a valuable candidate. We uh, had eight candidates that we contacted for interviews um, and of the eight, seven had returned calls to come in. Uh, unfortunately, the day of the first interviews, one um, bowed out, so we had a total of six candidates uh, that came forward for our two days of interviewing. Each interview was about 45 minutes. Uh, we had a great uh, panel of uh, interview team members, and uh, if you indulge me, I would like to mention them by name just because I appreciate the commitment that they've made. Um, I put the message out to uh, all staff at the junior senior high school, as well as um, I reached out to a member of the school committee who uh, is a parent of future students here uh, and also serves as a principal uh, in his other life, um, as well as uh, student representation and parent representation. So uh, representing seventh and eighth grade, we had Mrs. Jen Diaz. Uh, representing grades nine through 12, we had Mrs. Julia Sheehan and Ms. Cassie Wadden. Representing special services, we had our school psychologist, Tessa Ryan. Uh, representing the arts, we had Mr. Mark Ferrioli. Uh, as a parent uh, representative uh, on the school council, we had Mrs. Mary Beth Toomey. The two students that we had uh, were rising seniors, Sadie Nickar and Abby McCarthy. Our school committee representative was Mr. McLaughlin uh, and administrative assistant, uh, Jen Furia. And then myself and Patrick Leonard, our athletic director. Uh, so we all served on the committee. Uh, lots of great questions. Um, were uh, given to the candidates. Uh, we had r really high quali qualified candidates, um, but we did um, make recommendations upon deliberation and uh, we have three candidates that we are moving forward to the final round of interviews. Uh, those will be held next Tuesday. Uh, it will be a different panel uh, made up of uh, members of the, the leadership team within the district, uh, Superintendent Legault, uh, Business Administrator, Mr. Shea, Special Education Director, Mr. Fallon, Director of Guidance, uh, Mrs. Clifford, uh, as well as uh, key people here within the building, Mr. Doug Ortenzi, Head Custodian, Mrs. Diane Ashey, um, Administrative Assistant to the Principal. Uh, absolutely, there'll be school committee representation as well. Um, and they will conduct final rounds of interviews. Um, from there, there will also be reference checks done uh, to make sure that the candidate that we feel uh, we want to put forward and, and offer a contract to also has uh, quality recommendations from their um, current and former employees. So um, I, I'm hoping uh, within the, the next two weeks uh, we'll be ready for contract negotiation with a new principal for the junior senior high school. We could potentially know by June 20th by our next school committee meeting, maybe, or no? I, ideally, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Gina, what is the typical notice requirement of a principal? In other words, say you offered by, on June 20th, you had a contract ready to go and it was offered. What is the earliest they could start? July 1. In, in terms of typical. So I most contracts, yeah, yeah, most contracts would run through June 30th um, with a July 1 uh, start for a, a new principal. Do they have a notice requirement if their contract ran before? past June 30th? Everybody's contract is I know, I just didn't know if there so, was like a typical. So I, I don't know, but. You know I mean, what I'm trying to say, Liz. Yeah, I would just add that m most of the time, especially, the same boat. especially in the administration world, uh, usually there's an agreement. Superintendent calls another superintendent, says we'd like to have he or she come in a little bit earlier, or they would say we need to hold them for a couple of weeks. Can we do something different? Usually they, we can work that out. Um, I have not seen any names. I don't know where any candidate is coming from. I do know that I would like a different type of format. I did speak to Dr. Williams about that format today of having people in the audience possibly watching uh, the interview take place. Um, that being said, there, there needs to be things to be looked at in that, um, and I would like people to be involved in something like that uh, so they can see the principles. Um, however, um, again, when a principal gets into the final round, that's when their names will be released. So we, we, we're giving them time. Um, Dr. Williams has made some calls today. I don't know who those people are. I, haven't, I, don't, I don't get those names until way at the end. Um, the, once those names, uh, once Dr. Williams has talked to the candidates, then she will say we'll be releasing the names. Once those names are released, then they become public. Once we go public, then usually we will say these candidates will be, you know, I don't know, 
five to five to five forty five, six to six forty five, seven to seven forty five. Right, but there's got to be there's it, it's it, there's rules oh, right. and, no, no, and I know. But I mean, protocols and things like that. And you know, I want I want a good principal. We certainly want uh, someone to get involved here in East Bridgewater. We want someone to stay here, and we certainly want um, uh, people involved from the Similar community to, to, to your interview. Yep. In effect, it, yeah. it's public, but yep. right, and you're in the forum. The, the so, committee is the right. people. The hiring committee are the people who. Right. So engage. when we spoke today. Um, Dr. Williams was just going through to get sort of acceptance to coming back for a second round interview. That's, I don't know how many heard from, but, or if you haven't checked your messages yet, or. Is three but, rounds typical in, in the educational hiring yeah. world? Sometimes you have more, sometimes you have less. It depends on how quickly this goes and depends on how quickly someone wants to get in here. There are some people that want to get right in. There's some people that will say, I need to walk my, my school out and, and give them an opportunity to say goodbye. Most people that are going for a junior, senior high school principalship, elementary principalship, or middle school principalship, they, they know that they're <coughs> going to go out and interview, and they've usually talked to somebody, um, either to their colleague or to the central office, and said, I'm going to go out. No, I'm just saying it's, it's like three come in for interviews common. Is it three? Is it? Yep. She said, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, Thanks. And I think, too, that you know, given the process that, that, that Dr. Williams outlined, no one's going to be able to say that we weren't transparent. No one's going to be able to say we didn't involve teachers. Oh, I wasn't implying that. I was just curious. We're, we're, we're putting this information out there. Um, everyone can participate. I'm looking around this room right now, and I, I see so many people here. Um, keep coming back. <laughs> we, we have meetings twice a month. Everybody should come back. <laughs> yeah. Not just for, you know, hot topics. Come back. Outstanding graduation. We don't always have cupcakes, though. <laughs> no, those are special. <clears throat> That's so only the, retirement night. So. Is open forum? You can communicate back no. No. The public comment section is it's always cool. there. We, we have that at the beginning. Okay. All right. Apparently, no one knows discussions take place with the community. People care about the what's going on. Yeah. Sure. And you can reach out to us individually. We all have emails. I don't have our phone. We had a very good opinion that um, men in the green are about as far as. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, what, Tim. What did I say? Uh, as far as speaking with the parents, being able to speak to the parents, being able to, I think we need to come together as a community. There's a lot of people that may have great ideas. Um, so. Thank you. And you don't necessarily yeah. talk to the man on the green. He's great. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your and having a meeting on that. Yes. Thank you. So the graduation ceremony was last Sunday. It was wonderful, beautiful weather. Uh, I can't say enough about uh, Doug Ortenzi, John Roback, the the crew that cleaned up and got us ready for that and set up and and, and took everything down. They were terrific. Um, the the kids were outstanding. There was 130 graduates this year, outstanding, uh, going all over the place. Some going right out to the workforce. Um, some going to college, whether two-year, four-year technical school. Um, really nice bunch of kids. Uh, it was just a great day for everybody, and those are the days that you look for. We have a sixth grade stepping up ceremony coming up. Um, kindergarten went uh, two weeks ago, Mrs. Uh, Byrne. They're still in school, but they had their, um, we had their concert. Patriotic concert. We had their patriotic concert. So there's a lot of things going on, a lot of field trips going on this uh, last couple of weeks. Um, graduation is one big day for the junior or the high school uh, graduate, but we also have a lot of other things going on of uh, stepping up ceremonies, lots of things uh, at the Mitchell and the Central School. Reminder on Monday night. Can you give us um, a quick 30 second update on your um, neurologist? <laughs> Mr. Cog. I thought it was yeah. hilarious and awesome. Um, he, he's going to do great things, and I hope to see him on. I, I'm an advocate of Channel 10. But some people like Channel 12, but um, he's great, and I hope to see him again. And I'll ask, I'll ask him how the next two weeks are going to look outside. I'm just going to keep this going. All right. And, and the only reason I put that up on the website if he gives you permission, because I think yeah. it would be cool. It was fun. Yeah. Oh, you haven't. Seen, it is no, fun. I it says, I oh, it's on his awesome. YouTube. People have. Um, but we do have the print. Uh, we do have committees here tonight that want to pre yeah. present. Uh, the town meeting is on June 10th on Monday night, starting at 7 p.m. Uh, our certified budget. I hope um, I 
we're I, I spoke to Mr. Longo, the uh, interim town manager. Uh, John and I are confident that that's going to go through. We're confident that we're going to continue to get more more funds for the schools. We do believe that the House and Senate House and Means and the uh, legislation is going to continue to move the money. I was up there uh, last week today. Jean, uh, Dr. Williams and I were at a meeting this afternoon. Um, I was at one earlier this, and then at one at nine o'clock this morning. I met Dr. Williams. We left here at about 11:15 this morning. Um, this is all that the talk is right now. It's about getting that allocation from uh, moving us in Chapter 70 and get our funding up. Right now, we hope for an upswing of about $250,000. We did hear from a couple of our colleagues that were on the Hill yesterday that said um, they're looking at a little bit more, uh, that, that the governor is pushing for more money. So I keep your fingers crossed. We want more money. We want to get some more. We want to get more FTEs. We want to get more programs for our kids. We want to do the right thing. Uh, in the community and for the kids in the school district. Quick, too, who do I call? Uh, which, which of my state representatives? Like, all of them? All of them. Mr. Yeah. Brady, Brady all Dubois. Of <coughs> Brady, the school Dubois, committee. The school committee has an opportunity. We went and talked to them. Uh, day in yeah, the yeah, hill. Yeah, exactly. And I've been writing letters. Uh, um, and everybody I'm advocating all uh, <laughs> as much as I can, and I, I do believe we, we will get an up uptick. Uh, we, uh, and we want to say that there will be free child care. Uh, there will be free child care June 10th. At the town meeting, uh, we, and what? Yeah, beginning at seven o'clock. What's drop off the child care six forty-five? So can we get six forty-five? Sure. Doctor? I thought regular town meeting was at seven thirty, but I'll let Mrs. Ross. Know I've got seven o'clock. I've got seven o'clock. Drop off time is six forty-five. Okay. Six forty-five. I've got seven. I've dropped my kids off there, and they had a blast. Letter of uh Get a letter of resignation from Danielle Randall, an instructional support assistant from Central School, effective June thirtieth, two nineteen. We hate to lose anybody over there, She's but we wish her the best of luck. I know. She's got, yep. She got a great opportunity. I know you're excited for her, and I wish her the best of luck. No, I, I think it's the closing of the year. Um, I appreciate everybody coming. There is a chance. Uh, and I hope that we can sit and talk and, and always continue our conversation and collaborative um, efforts. Um, we look we look forward to moving this moving East Bridgewater forward. We're a pre-K through 12 district. Um, one of the things that we do in central office, both of us, uh, or all of us, is we are a PK through 12 district. So my eyes are not just on, on focused on one, it's on all. So um, we've got, you know, I want to thank Mr. Gentile uh, for his works this year. Uh, Ms. Dupre, always a uh, breath of fresh air, a smile always in the hallway. I appreciate all you do down there at uh, the Mitchell School. Uh, great evaluator, always on time, always, always pushing. Um, to make us better. Thank you. Jen McPartland, great job this year uh, with all that you do, uh, helping us with the data, the map, uh, on, the, on the curriculum facilitator side. We, we really appreciate all you do. Uh, Deb Nichols, um, emotional year for yourself. You've got a daughter who uh, graduated uh, last week, I think, on Saturday. Um, I saw you on Monday, and uh, you were, your hands were still a little shaky, and you're still a little <laughs> emotional. Um, we went through it with you, I feel, because I've known you for four years now. And I watched her from a freshman. I watched you going all over the place. I watched you uh, uh, doing your own cartwheels uh, to show us how good she was as a cheerleader. And um, congratulations to you. You really did a nice job this year. Um, you really upped your game. And you're a tremendous leader uh, at Central School. Kate, as always, uh, I know we've, uh, we laugh a lot. Kate and I do. I don't know any other way to say it. Kate, this year has been great. Your kindness, your mantra, and your continued, continued relentlessness on mindfulness for all children and for your staff. Every morning going in, regardless at what time, listening to you do that mantra has been great for me. And I know that you and I, uh, Kate has come to my administra our administrative meetings and we've had her do mindful mindfulness training with us. It has been a, a pleasure to go through that. I even went to, I go to their faculty meetings um, and I have uh, got to uh, go in and watch mindfulness training there. So I want to thank the principals for all that they do. Um, Tara Noyes, she, she should still be, did Tara walk? Oh, she there? Tara. Tara's done a tremendous job as assistant principal <laughs> walking us out of the year here. It's not easy being alone. Uh, we wish her the best of luck through the interview process and we wish her the, the best of luck with us here. She's done a great job. Um, but this closes it out when we see our administrators uh, this, at this 
uh, school committee meeting. So I want to thank you guys. You did a great job for us. I don't know if you want to add anything. But I got to thank Dr. Williams. <laughs> Last but not least, John. Yeah, John. Uh, John has been, uh, John always, uh, always really tries to work hard for the kids and trying to get us more support and trying to allocate more funds uh, towards the students and always finding uh, ways to get us more um, for the buck. And we're going to continue to try to do that. Dr. Williams, again. Um, <laughs> I guess that sums it up. Uh, no, uh, just you, you can't do this alone, true partner in the sense of it, and uh, we get things done and we'll get them done again. So thank you for, thanks for the administrative team, thanks for this evening, and you've got Karen Clifford and for social and emotional, I don't know who's with you, but you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, well, next up on all our, are we, are we going out of order? In all of our staff. I'm just talking about the administrators. No, I know. Because we're not, we'll, we'll have time to speak to the, to the faculty. Well, we're still meeting again, right? We're and they, we have June 20th. Next up, we have strategic plan number one, curriculum and instruction. We have Jennifer oh, I'm sorry, that was my fault. Ted Dupre. Turn the page. Please come, come up. Are they up here? Welcome, Ted. Meeting with us. Great, thank you. Um, just this week, our district data and instruction team um, met. We had created a, um, a pretty lot. <laughs> it's okay. We had created a pretty lofty goal um, of looking at our student growth rather than looking at our um, just the achievement levels of our students. Um, so, in doing so, our data is there in red. Um, that num those numbers represent the percentage of our students that met or exceeded um, their projected growth in math. And projected growth is personal to every single student. Okay? So at the uh, Central School, the goal was for 70% of students K-2 ELA and math classes. Um, at Mitchell School, they had a different goal for math and ELA, 70% of students for math. Um, the scores are down there. I do have printouts for you that you can take with you later on. Um, on the next page, we also have our, um, the continuation of Mitchell School for ELA, and then also at the high school. So that represent, those numbers represent, like I said, the growth of our, of our students individually. Average growth um, for across an entire cohort is around 50 to 55 percent. So as a district, we went above and beyond and created goals that were 55 or 60 or 70 percent because we wanted to be better than the average. Okay? Um, so those being um, respectable numbers, I do want to also bring up this achievement um, table right here, where achievement is what we most often look at. We look at MCAS scores. We look at how do our students compare to other students in the same grade level. Um, so across the nation, those numbers right there represent the achievement of our students. So for example, if you look at grade one, our reading scores are in the 97th percentile according to math. And in math, they're in the 96th percentile. Um, all of these numbers, if you go all the way across, we have some pretty amazing data right there. So we are doing wonderful things. The educators in this district are doing amazing things. They're pushing our students. We see we can hold our own with other students um, of the same age and the same grade level. And on the earlier slides, we were talking about growth. So we're also trying to push that envelope with, yes, our student might be a fifth grader and they're doing really well in fifth grade, but they might be ready for things that are above and beyond fifth grade. So that's what um, we're trying to do as a district, is provide opportunities for all students to grow overall. All right. Um, curriculum review cycle, we have a six-year cycle. Uh, this year was wellness. Um, the intention was that this entire year would be focused just on, on the wellness, but we found out that Massachusetts was finally going to update uh, their comprehensive health curriculum frameworks um, 
it hadn't been done since 1999, so it was definitely <laughs> time for them to do so. Um, we were in, um, fortunate enough to have two of our staff members work with DESE. Michelle Amaral and Sarah Moore um, have been attending meetings all year long, and they are able to bring back information to us about where the, the state is going in terms of these frameworks. And they're going to cover all types of topics from health to physical education to social emotional learning. So we are using those ideas to develop our pre-K to 12 curriculum, but also um, looking at them with our district plan. And guidance, health, physical education have all been involved in those, in those meetings. Um, they don't expect that those frameworks are going to be completely done until the summertime or maybe even the fall. So we've had to kind of shift a little bit of that wellness cycle is going to go into next year, so you'll hear more about it again. Um, but next year's review cycle is going to be focused on history, social science, and foreign language. Um, those <coughs> frameworks were finalized last July, so this year our teachers have been really um, digging in, getting used to the changes, figuring out where things need to shift around. And I'm in talks right now with a lot of the grade levels about possible potential pilots for the fall um, to look at different materials that are out there to address all the new standards. Um, the biggest changes are the civics. Um, there's a heavy civics focus in grade eight, and there's going to be civics projects required by the state at um, the eighth grade level and also the high school level. And those, more information is coming out um, as they roll out from the state. Um, the final thing that's the biggest change is those seven practice standards. Um, within the framework, they have identified seven um, skills that students need to work on. Um, in, rather than just the rote memorization of, of history topics and dates and maps, and it's now incorporating the ability to use um, civic knowledge and questioning and research and looking at credibility of documents, um, looking at point of view, so that not only does a student just study the content that's in front of them, they're able to apply it to a number of different um, portions of social studies, but also their life moving forward. Um, and lastly embedded in that is the literacy standards. So social studies teachers also have responsibility to incorporate literacy standards because reading a historical document is different than reading a piece of literature. So there are skills that go along with that. So we're going to spend all of next year looking for the best resources, best um, supports for those teachers to be able to implement uh, the new standards. So do we have a new wellness curriculum for 1920? Or is it on hold because of the state? The one so we'll have a, a wellness action plan, for the, which will for the have specific objectives that will fall under nutrition, health, PE, um, wellness, both mental health wellness and staff wellness. So we'll have those objectives in place for a wellness plan, but the curriculum will continue to evolve because the teachers will use next year uh, to look at the new standards and then make a, a plan to decide what resources so as Mr. McCartman said, it will be a little bit of a hybrid because the money we will be dedicate to health and wellness won't all be used because we don't have a plan. We'll use a little bit for some of the social studies that we already are aware of uh, and so that next year we can dedicate some of the funds that will have been allocated to social studies and foreign language to back the public. And when does this new civics requirement go into effect? Right, they're saying next year. year, yeah, that's what they said. Um, and they're going to be rolled, um, I get all the updates from Desi, and they're going to be up, um, giving out samples of what these civics projects could look like, and they're also going to be sending out um, their, protect, their potential timeline um, for implementing it. But their intention is that we should be starting these civics projects. All right, thanks, Jen. So the district has spent a significant amount of time on writing this year, and all three schools have made significant contributions to that writing progress. Just to highlight some of those things, in Central School, they completed and accomplished nine common writing prompts per grade level. They also designed rubrics in order to evaluate the student's writing, and they worked on discussing a shared language and practices around writing. So for example, the district has been trained in using Empower Writing, and with Empower Writing, it comes its own language. There are templates that come with it. They talk about Freds and Seymours and announcements. And if you don't know the pro program, you may not know what they're talking about. But if we use that language as teachers, starting in pre-K all the way up to the high school, kids will know and become used to that language, and it becomes a common language. We found that's really important to do. And we're working on taking that at Central School and using that as our foundation 
and transferring those practices to the Mitchell School in a developmentally appropriate way. So based on what Central did this year, they developed the nine prompts based on what DESE requires in the three types of writing. So three narrative, three expository, and three opinion or argumentative. We're going to do the same thing at the Mitchell School. Mr. Gentile, myself, Mrs. McPartland, we have had numerous discussions about really unifying the district in our processes and our language, and we decided for next year to also do nine common writing prompts and develop those rubrics and make sure those writings go across the content areas. So some will focus on math, some in science. So kids could write a narrative in science if they're studying plants about the life of an apple and what it's like to kind of go from the beginning to the end and it also will demonstrate knowledge in that content area as well. So we look to the future for our teachers to develop those prompts that are engaging and will entice them to write and also develop those rubrics to go along with it. We also are developing that shared language and practices. One of the things that we focused on this year and we keep going deeper and deeper with the writing is writing conferences and how to conference best with students and what's most effective in transferring it to their final products. So we've looked at different checklists that teachers use. We look at the conversations that teachers are having when it comes to writing. And we're trying to find out what is the most effective way. We're going to continue to delve deeper into that next year as well. And then at the junior senior high school, they're looking at exploring those literacy standards that Mrs. McPartland had talked about into the content areas that are very specific and specialized. So just incorporating more writing opportunities and more quick writes and more technical writing in the subject areas in which they teach. We found in general there are certain practices based on our research, discussion, and our delving deep into writing this year that we want kids to continue to do more of in the 1920 school year, and that is journaling. So one of the things that we had discussions with our special area teachers about, because if everyone's invested in writing, everyone's going to be doing writing. Our special area teachers this year focused on writing in their content areas. So kids wrote in music, they wrote in phys ed, in art, in wellness. Uh, and the prompts that they came up with were very creative. So for example, in the music department, they would say things like, OK, you're on an island, you're on a deserted island, you have one instrument. What instrument would it be and why? So there were things that enticed students to write. That's another thing that we came up with. We have to develop engaging writing prompts for our students, things that will entice them to write. In a discussion with our computer teachers, they were thinking about prompts. One that they came up with that enticed students is Minecraft is a very popular, as well as Fortnite, video game. Explain why it's so popular and engaging. So again, they were all excited to write about that, of course. Um, then we're talking about differentiating and writing. Those are some things we'll be discussing as we move forward. We also decided to use editing marks that are common across the grade levels. So if they needed to add a capital, a period, there are editing marks that go along with the John Collins program that we used to use, and we're all going to be incorporating those for next year. So a lot of work in writing, very proud of our accomplishments, but as always, a lot more to do, a lot more to achieve, and uh, we set those standards really high. I'm very happy to see the kids getting all of this writing in. And so there were a few of us at the Young Authors Day. Yes. And those third graders are so insightful in there. I was listening, well, and Rob was in my group. He was in my room. Um, I yelled at Listening everybody. to the kids with their writing was just, I was, I was very impressed. They did a great job. I was too. I agree. That's great. And it's a wonderful activity that our third grade teachers do. And our kids get really excited about it, our third graders. So thank you for and coming writing, today. Writing, they will use that for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. I'm very happy that we have this initiative in the district. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And the next thing I just want to talk about is summer reading. So the district has decided to go along with the theme of responsibility this year. It is a requirement of all students to do their summer reading. As we know, reading is very important too, just like the writing is. We don't want to have that summer slide. So again, we want to try to make it fun for our students, but also connect it to something that we value here in the district, and that is responsibility. So this summer, Central School, pre-K to 2, they're going to all be reading at those grade levels the same book, Pigsty by Mark Teague, and they'll be answering the question, how did Wendell show he was responsible? Now, they can do that in multiple ways, as Dr. Williams talked about with the UDL, and this is also for the Mitchell School and the Junior Senior High School. They have choices and options of ways to demonstrate 
how the character or how the book showed responsibility. They could make a video. They could do a rap song. They could write about it if they want to. They could write a poem. This is all about UDL and the choices. We really want to target their own way to demonstrate what they learned and what they understood. Central schools also be uh, logging their minutes. They want to log 500 minutes on Scholastic Rita Palooza. At the Mitchell and Junior Senior High, as I said, we will recommend some titles. So there are some kids that will say, I'm not really sure what book demonstrates responsibility. We have some title choices for them, or they can pick their own. It's the same at the Junior Senior High School and then submit a choice-based response on how the book demonstrated responsibility. So we're excited about this for our kids. Gives them an opportunity to read. They could always read more as well. They wanted to read more than one book, but it is something that we are requiring of our students this year. They're we doing that trivia thing again. They no. Should, yeah. no trivia this they year. They are doing AM. Um, I know that Central School is doing a scavenger hunt as an optional activity. Mm -hmm. And there'll probably be some paper going home so that the students have some. Right, I assume something will be going home Central, shortly. Central yes. School has sent everything home. Um, was it today? Yep, everything went home today at Central School. Um, in order to be green, the uh, Mitchell and High School are, it's electronic, it's live on the website right now. And tomorrow there will be a message going home to all families that summer reading information is live. Yeah, um, but, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And so, and that, um, and <coughs> there will also be paper right. copies at both of the main offices, uh, actually all three main offices and at the public library. Great. Yep. Well, thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you so well, much. Well, that's our update. I'm going to introduce now Mrs. Karen Clifford, who's going to do the social emotional piece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Happy thank summer. You. Thank you. Same to you. Thanks for having us. I'm coming to visit next Wednesday. Excellent. Welcome, Mrs. Come Clifford. see us. Welcome to you. Yes. Thanks, Karen. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Just that way. Okay. We we can do that. Mm -hmm. So just quickly at a glance, I know I've reported a couple of times, I just wanted to talk specifically about some counselor PD that we did around the health and wellness um, curriculum review that we undertook this year. We did some, we went to a training on break free from depression, which was actually recommended to us by a parent from this community that works at a different school. It's had a very successful program. He was very kind and shared all of his information with us. We went, um, four counselors and myself went up to his school and saw it in action. So it is a prevention suicide, so, I'm sorry, suicide prevention program that we are going to roll out in the fall to eighth grade and 12th grade. And we'll continue doing eighth and twelfth grade until we get to a point where we're just doing eighth grade. I know nine, nine, ten, eleven. So this year we'll do eighth and twelfth, and then next year those eighth graders will be ninth graders. We'll do eighth and twelfth again until oh, we build up, so that we're just doing it in eighth grade every year. Yeah. We've done a lot of social emotional learning. We've done some trauma intervention PD. The guidance department, um, myself and Tessa Ryan, the school psychologist put together some parent community education presentations. We did social emotional learning. We did anxiety, depression, transitions, and mood changes. The entire guidance department in the enrichment classes for seventh and eighth grade did lessons on resilience, task initiation, self-esteem, social thinking, emotional control. We presented the bullying. Um, on bullying and we introduced the Stop It app this year and we did planning and prioritization. One of the handouts that I gave you, this one, the colors, is a new platform panorama that we're going to do a student survey. We will do it by the end of this year. It's going to be <coughs> district-wide. I'm sorry, I don't think I got that one. Oh, yeah. Are we missing something? This one? Uh, one was supposed to go that way and one was supposed to go the other way. So <laughs> I, didn't want to right, I didn't you. get this one. Oh, nope, it's right there. You have it. It's all of it. All three pages. Yeah, you have it. No, there's not a third page yet. Can you just hold up the video? You show, hold it up so I know what it looks like. Well, it's missing okay. this page. It's missing this page. That's mine. Yeah, but Oz doesn't have that page. Oh, yeah, this is mine. This, this is not for you. It's very similar to what I shared. Yeah. Right, I was going to say, yeah. can we just see this? Yep. 
So you probably just saw it, but we're going to do it. It's going to be attached to school brains, and it's going to give us that kind of information that a counselor will be able to track their whole um, caseload or one student at a time or grade level. It's going to, that I think is going to be instrumental data for us to use to target that middle 60% that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. But Karen, is this going to be, it's the same platform that Gina introduced, yes. but is it going to be actually the, the reports itself going to be connected? completely so it's just going to be two separate areas but connected what's two separate areas yeah it'll so, be one view yeah okay so sorry yeah and social mo yes. okay so it's going to be connected to our yep. information system of school brains and we, when we do the survey it's going It'll to be out. The data okay. from a committee right perspective we're going to see this as aggregate aggregate data or individual data we wouldn't share like I'm, I'm going to look yeah, yeah like I, I, I can see my sons yeah. so my daughters but, have, um, but we'll see we'll see aggregate type. Yes, uh, grade level and progress of data. Yeah. Do parents see this platform? I forget. I know you said it. Will we talked about it? But I forget. No. Right. Um, we haven't gotten that far in the discussion as to whether this would then ultimately be something that teachers would use to share with parents um, as we get more familiar with it. And it's valuable mm -hmm. to give parents this view. Um, but we haven't even gotten that far for staff to even. Uh, know how to utilize it. So we want to make sure that we were um, proficient in it before we started using it um, in conferences. you got to start sometime. Right. <laughs> so as a guidance counselor, I see myself, as we roll it out, being able to have that conversation with an individual parent and sharing that data, yeah. putting it through the portal where a parent is not going to necessarily know how to navigate it, I don't see that happening right yet okay. until we have some sort of education. So grade six, class of 2025, um, student orientations will be held Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, June 25, 26, and 27, 915 to 1215. We are doing our grade eight, class of 2023, orientation to freshman year will be Wednesday, August 21st. As I mentioned, ne for next year, we will be doing the break free from depression. As a pilot, we're going to start with students in grades eight through 12. We will be doing a presentation to the community. We will also be doing a staff training before we roll it out to students. As Mr. Prey said, so we want to make sure that the teachers are on board with the language that the students are going to be hearing in this presentation so that everybody's using that common language. We have a community service in the, in the works, do we, Ms. Mm -hmm. Pennington? hoping that we bring it to the June 20th meeting. That's okay. the goal. So it's I'm ready. working with Ms. Pennington about um, community service and looking forward to a, a graduation requirement. So we've done some preliminary work. I think you have a, pro a proposal in your policies group. One thing that I'm going to be working on over the summer is to create a bulletin board for the community to be able to post those opportunities because once we roll this out, we're going to have to have those opportunities for students as well as to work with the student groups that we have in our building to promote those service opportunities. So Karen, just to clarify, the, the the community, the board will actually be accessible by the community and they can make their posting opportunities or will it come through you, through guidance? So I want to say yes to the first part, but I, I need it's to, still to be determined. coordinate with Aaron Fisher, our okay. tech guru, to see if, if that is going to be able to be posted by the community because I'd like okay. it to be on our website. So I don't know if it will be an access problem. It might have to go through me. I also want to have a physical board in the cafeteria so that students could <laughs> you know, grab a phone number, jot down some information. Okay, I just want to capture that correctly so we can talk a little more. Here? Yes. <laughs> the other thing that I passed out is um, something that two of my guidance counselors worked on this year as a, for one of their SMART goals, and it's an interactive community resource database. So what I gave you, this is this one, um, on the left-hand side, you can see different resource categories, a resource description, and then there's a link. At the top, you can see there's two buttons, one for a resource category and one for school age. So if you look at the second page, you can see the drop-down for the resource category. So it's all the different categories of resources. Do you see what I'm... And then the next page, it shows school age. So it's going to be categorized for Central School Age Group, East Bridgewater Junior Senior High School, and the Mitchell. 
and who has access to this? So this is going to be on the website. It so will be, be interactive, everybody. so it will be everybody. That's great. So as a parent of a student in kindergarten, so this came off of our parent education. We did not have a huge turnout for that, and I understand that people have children at home and the different responsibilities. So what we did was we posted all of our PowerPoint presentations online, and this is just a way to sort of combine all those resources into one place. So a parent of a central school student who might be thinking their child has anxiety can search specifically for anxiety for that age group, come up with a list of books to read to that student, different community resources that might be available. So this is going to be something that's going to continue to develop and grow, and it will have to be something that we will have to continue to update. Um, quickly had an awesome anxiety uh, library in her office, I remember. Oh yeah, we're going to link into that. I am hoping to put together a letter explaining to parents how to use it and, and what the benefits would be over the summer and have it roll out in the fall. Okay. I also have to work with the counselors in the other buildings so they, they become familiar with how to update for their age group. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. So they can add resources at any time? Is that what yes, you mean by updating their wanna, group? Yeah, no, that's awesome. We want to update them. We want to change them. We want to add them. We get a lot of those those mailings and we try to disseminate that information throughout the district this will be a place where we can just plug it in Thank you. so also new for next year is that we are partnering with North River Collaborative and, and Mr. Phelan may talk about this a little bit in his presentation so we are going to have some social work interns come into the buildings we're going to have two at the high school and one at the Mitchell we just got word today that we're going to meet with the high school candidates one is a male, one is a female. They will cover all five days and um, cross over on one day. So they do three days They're each. They're both three days, nice. They do three That's days great. each. So one day they'll both be there, the other two days. Well, so we'll have five days coverage with a social work intern in the high school, which is awesome. Three-day candidates are way better than the two-day candidates. They're, they're mm -hmm. like, they are. I mean, just the ones that want the three-day opportunities are right. usually way better counselors. Yeah. And what was nice is one of them actually reworked her schedule so that she could accommodate the other days that the first person wasn't going to do. And then at the Mitchell, we'll have one three-day candidate, so we'll have three days of coverage at the Mitchell. Now, do your, do your um, counselors within each school supervise them, or does, is it a central person that supervises them? Multiple? So my understanding, what we talked about, is that I would be the supervisor. Well, I will be the point person for the district. Mm -hmm. They are supervised by North River. So we don't have right. to provide that hour of supervision. But you have the, the, you have the meeting with their North River supervisor yes. to talk about their progress yes. and everything. Yes. Great. Yeah. So that would be a great um, addition to our staff. And then also new is I'm going to have a parent orientation for grade six um, upcoming parents on next Wednesday at 630. The reason I added that is I did the student orientations last year, and then when the students went home, they had provided their parents with some misinformation, and I got a lot of phone calls over the summer, so I had to say the same thing. Is that sixth grade, outgoing sixth grade, or incoming sixth grade? Outgoing sixth grade. Outgoing sixth, up sixth to the seventh. So I thought I'll give the information to the parents so that when the students come home, everybody so knows what they do. Parents will come on Wednesday evening. Students are going to come that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at the end of June. And they're also going to come to Step Up Day on Monday. So, Karen, just a, a, of note, because we had brought this up when uh, Mrs. Fisher was here and doing her presentation on all of the great um, tech stuff she does. Mm -hmm. We had made the point that when um, students come up from sixth grade up to seventh grade, the communication to parents kind of changes somewhat depending on not depending on the teacher per se, but for example, there's a lot more Twitter activity. Um, and I had talked to a couple parents in like a community forum, not related to the school at all, but they happened to be in it. And they were saying how, you know, they had concerns that they don't allow their kids to have social media and they're concerned about how communication is done at this level. So we had mentioned to Mrs. Fisher, perhaps, you know, from a tech standpoint, that could be something passed along to the parents so they don't have this great fear of the unknown because a lot of parents are like I don't even know how to use Twitter and it's not necessarily widely used here at the high school but it's used enough yeah. so I don't know if that's built into the orientation it might be just I don't know so I'm not sure I, I follow your question in it, the orientation am I at, 
providing them with information of how to access Twitter? Well, not really how to access it, but just the indication that communication changes a little from that school coming up here. So that is one of the threads. As the, as the district guidance director, I have been trying to solidify and carry from building to building. So I did send a letter out, or actually Mr. Gentile sent the letter out for me to all seventh grade, sixth grade parents regarding all the transition activities that we were doing, both at the Mitchell School as well as up here. So all of that information went home in a letter, and it was emailed. I, would cont I continue to do that up here. I do not tweet. I'm not asking either, you to Aaron, tweet. Either. I would love to also see like a um, you know, Central Times, the middle school connection, like something like that for the high school that, so not necessarily to yeah. it, but put up on the web or something because it's so hard to keep track of everything unless you have like multiple. So one of the things we did accounts. last year was we made a district calendar that's on the website, on the main page, and each school is in a diff represented in a different color. So and if you, you have that. a student in just one building, you could click just that one color and see those activities. If you have students in multiple buildings, you can, you could highlight the Mitchell and the high school and mm -hmm. see so that you would, yep. so that we can be aware of when we're cross um, scheduling so that we become a little bit more aware of that. that we but might not want to have our art show on the same day as mm -hmm. a concert at the Mitchell. But even for parents of these younger kids who haven't had a child come up to the school, mm -hmm. to understand that there's a lot of information on the website and just to get familiar with it, because I think they rely on central times, they rely on, True. you know, m not more personalized, but more available communication, whereas at this level, it's a little bit different to navigate, and I think some parents are taken by surprise, and like, oh my gosh, how come there's no information? How come I didn't know about this? How come I didn't know about that? Well, it's, it's there, you just have to reorient yourself. Good point. Okay. I'll try to figure that out. Well, the calendar, you know, I didn't even know, know that existed. <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah, the calendar. I didn't even know that was out there. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Clifford. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hmm? I'll have a good summer. Okay, I know. <laughs> I know you're still there. I'll see you. We have sure. Dr. Gina Williams and Mrs. Deb, Deb Nichols to talk about professional development. Welcome. Thank you, and welcome to the new members of the committee. This evening, um, Dr. Williams and I are just going to kind of wrap up our year in professional development. I know a very important puck dropped about an hour ago, so we will try to uh, roll our way through I don't through know what this. you're referring to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll try to roll our way through this. As we've said um, over the course of many years, the professional development is the tie that binds all of the parts of the strategic plan together. We provide the professional development for technology to make that a successful initiative. We provide professional development for social emotional learning to make that successful as well as the instruction and curriculum. So we're really the, uh, the overarching piece that ties everybody together. So we've had another successful year um, spending money, Title II grant. Um, <laughs> this year we were awarded $45,888. Um, teachers requested a wide variety of um, workshops and other events to attend that we were able to allow them to do based on that funding. Every professional development academy meeting begins with going through the request forms and um, allotting people and allowing people to go to the trainings that they would like to go to. So every, it ranged from traumatized child, um, the American Speech and Language National Conference was in Boston this year, so all of our speech and language pathologists were able to attend that, um, which was very exciting for them. Uh, parent, um, Mrs. Clifford's staff went to um, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Toolbox for children and adolescents, MassQ, STEAM trainings, there's just such a wide variety um, that kind of target each teacher, their content area, and their passions with education. We also provided ALICE training for all of the employees in the district. And when I say all, I mean all, the cafeteria workers, um, everybody that is in our school, nurses, custodians, all the staff, teaching assistants. Uh, so that was a very widespread and um, much needed training for all of us. And we were also able to have meetings during um, the PTO to explain it more to parents and address the concerns that they had about how we were training their kiddos. Um, we've had the UDL training, as Dr. Williams mentioned earlier. It's the first year of a three-year commitment that the district has um, with um, 
that with the CAST program, and as she mentioned, there'll be another whole cohort going through the first year of programming next year. So I'm really excited about that, because rumor has it I'm part of the cohort. <laughs> um, we also had approximately 100 in-house PD opportunities. We had ready math training this year. We had iPads in the classroom, which was run by a staff member. Mini maker spaces also run by staff members. Google Classroom, social emotional training, safety care training um, that's put on by staff here. Again, so it's not only outside, we're also able to provide quality professional development for teachers within the, our, the confines of our district. We had uh, several guest speakers this year, and it was kind of like a social emotional sandwich. We had Pam Garamone, who kicked off our years, and she was the happiness expert. So she talked to all of us and built us all up for the year about how to be happy and joyful in our career and with our classrooms and interacting with our students. Then we had Joel Restuccia and Ed Jacobs come, and they were the traumatized children. So then it got pretty heavy. And, and how are we going to help these students that we don't know what they've come in from in the morning. You know, maybe they had to get their little brother and sister dressed. Maybe they had to listen to their parents arguing. Maybe the police were at their house that night. We don't know what children are coming to school with and what barriers they have emotionally to learning. So we had a really hard day as far as your heart goes, at least mine that day. And then we beefed ourselves back up again with happiness with Norm Bosio, who was hysterical. He was a great speaker. And his mantra for all of us was, do what you love and love what you do. And if you're not doing what you love and you're here, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, so it was, a, it was a great rally point for being reflective on your practice and how important we are in the lives of children and how blessed we are to be able to be a part of their lives every day. Um, for the first time, we put on a, a book study, and it was about UDL. Um, Mrs. McPartland and Mrs. Fleming led those book studies, and we were able to invite <coughs> staff from other <coughs> districts to come in and join the book study. So that was a new venture for us this year. It was really exciting. And looking ahead, we have granted out all of our mini grants. Again, we have spent all of our money. Um, one of the Many grants went to Deanna Monroe, who is going to be putting on a responsive classroom training. It'll be a four-day training that's open to the central school staff as well as the Mitchell school staff and how to implement the responsive classroom techniques and strategies. We we'll also have teachers working on creating choice boards, which are related to the UDL learning. And we also have staff from the high school going to trainings to be able to be certified to teach the AP courses. Uh, so that's exciting for all buildings in the district. We have our re curriculum review cycle coming up in 1920, just as Mrs. McPartland mentioned earlier. We have the social studies committees. We're working on inclusive practices. We'll continue to do that as we journey towards becoming the best that we can be and including all students in their learning every day. Um, we spent some time this year, and we're just in the, developmenting, the development stages of the EB University, which would be an opportunity for our staff to provide workshops and professional development for other staff members running workshops um, on different topics that they would write a curriculum for and then present it to staff. Um, we're looking at it being available to earn PDPs and potentially, um, what, do you, what did we name them, Viking? Viking credits uh, that would possibly lead to um, them moving on a salary scale. So by accumulating Viking credits, um, by taking these series of workshops, uh, it would be an opportunity for staff to then use those credits to put towards movement on the salary. So we're developing it. Uh, uh, certainly it would need to be something that would need to be negotiated because it would be part of um, contractual language. And as Dr. Williams told you at the previous meeting, we've been working on the Alternative Learning Day initiative. Um, in case of inclement weather when students couldn't come to school, giving them an option to continue their learning in a different way. So we'll continue to wait on DESE and see what they come down with as far as regulations on that. And as we learn more about that, we'll let you know. Thank you. You're welcome. One question. My question is, it might be a surprise, so maybe you don't even know yet, and it might be a surprise you might not want to say. Any idea who the guest speaker is for September for opening day? Uh, so we've reached out to Dr. Katie Novak um, mm. for Universal Design for Life. Uh, she's very sought after. 
Um, so we're crossing our fingers, uh, but that's what, what our hope is at this point in time. Can I come? Sure. This is because I just want to echo what Dr. Legault said earlier on. Um, you know, I know you were uh, happy enough to have your daughter graduate high school, and I don't think what she does know is that I have a long-standing relationship with your family from years ago, and I, I was actually honored enough to be. I got an email in February from the administration at Middlebar High School to invite me to the graduation because I have a, a really special relationship with a lot of the kids that were in Erin's class as they made their way up through middle school. And so they kind of stuck me at the edge of the stage as the kids got the diplomas to come off. And I got hugs and handshakes and high fives and tears. And I can honestly say it was the most touching day I've had as an educator to see those kids and see them grow up into young men and women. And your daughter, Erin, was included. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, sir. Yep. It was a great day for all of us. And now tonight she's at BSU for her freshman orientation, and she is now the little fish in the big pond. So. And she's texting you like, Mom, pick yes. me up. Uh, Mom, she's what do I do? What are the last four digits of my social security number? <laughs> all those guys she there. wants to be a teacher. She is going into early, ch early childhood education. That's great. Very yeah. proud of her. Yep. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy summer. Thank you. Congratulations. Happy summer. Thank you. I was remiss. Erin uh, Fisher is one of our other uh, facilitators, technology. She was here at the last, back, uh, last um, school committee meeting. We can't do this without all of them. All of them, I, want, I thank them this evening. But uh, again, as, mu as much as schedules are so important, and as much as communicating what we need to communicate together, and having monies to allocate and to do things with and have a good budget. The things that we listen to in the second half of this meeting is what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And to watch Jen McPartland and Deb Dupre, and Karen Clifford, and Dr. Williams and Deb Nichols, and Aaron Fisher the last time, and John Phelan, I'm gonna get him up. Uh, he's going to go one more time and just give us a quick sped uh, special education roundabout uh, roundup. This is what we're here for. And we'll continue the communication. We, we heard it loud and clear. A shell is a shell. A shell is a shell. It's what is inside the shell is what's important. And watching tonight and seeing that the elementary school grades one and two are at the 97 and 98 percentile and that the Mitchell school we saw so many gains this year in growth with the students because of the resiliency that Mrs. McPartland uh, has talked with all the teachers about how Deb Dupre has gone in and talked to the students about about being resilient and now Mr. Gentile bringing the teachers in and, and talking to them about this is what it is about instruction, when I talk to you as the leader of the building, the instructional component is where we're at to raise, to enhance growth for students. Students can be really bright, but they can get stuck. And the only way they're gonna get growth is by instructional leadership in the classroom. You saw great leaders here talk about all the great things that we're doing, that they are doing, that are intact, that are on the docket. It's a shell. We're going to listen. We're not going to stop. We're going to keep going forward. But maybe next time, I, I, I'd like to put them first. Because this is what education is about. And it shouldn't be left to a room of just us mm -hmm. and administrators who work all the time. Mm -hmm. And the faculty is great, and the teachers are magnificent, and everybody does a great job, and we, we work, Dr. Williams works really hard too. But this is wrong. It should go first for next year. They do a lot of work for us on a daily basis, and I'd like them to go first from now on. I don't need a superintendent's corner. Put them up in front, let us watch them. Most definitely do. And, and, and let them talk to everybody so everybody gets to see them. And if, they, and if we want an open forum to talk about schedules or communicating um, our new social-emotional platform or whatever, let them come. Let, let, let Deb Nichols come and tell, tell us about the professional development opportunities that will help us with special-emotional 
uh, or, or social and emotional. Let Deb Dupre come in and talk about the writing and the writing prompts that aren't just at Mitchell School, that are for, for a transition to seventh and eighth grade. Let Kate Byrne come in and say, there's a reason we're 96, 97 and 98 in, Kate, in one and two. Ask her what it is, she'll tell you. It's a lot of hard work over there. If you haven't watched Kate talk to a teacher, it's intense. And it's not intense because she's being mean and it's not intense because she's arguing. It's being intense because she knows they can do it. And K1, pre-K one, two, I've learned a lot about in the last four years with Dr. Williams and a lot from Kate and um, Deb Nichols and a lot just being around that because I, I was high school. I was seven through 12, so I get this. But this is, the, this is what we're here for. And put them up in front, All set. please. All set. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, well, committee, I report to you public comment as the very last item before we adjourn. I don't see any reason why we. I think we can do that idea. too. Um, next up, we have Mr. John Phelan. Sweet. Well, you got two minutes. After all that, you do that. Listen, this is why we got this guy. You don't need to bang a gavel. No flies on Jay. Two minutes on the stopwatch. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. He'll get it down. So, I mean, for this year, I would say special education is definitely moving in the right direction. As a district, we're moving in the direction of, of, of inclusion for all students, becoming an inclusive district. The UDL initiatives that across the district are being done, the Universal Design for Learning initiatives, are really kind of helping to open that up um, and, and really helping all kids and all learners. Um, as as um, Ms. Clifford talked about earlier, bringing in the social work interns, I think is going to be great for our social emotional pieces for our kids. Those interns are, are phenomenal. I've heard nothing but good things about them. They do work in a couple other districts and, and talking with my colleagues in those other districts. They, they have a lot of respect for them. So I think it'll be great for our kids all around. Um, we're moving, gonna continue to move next year into that inclusive role. We're looking to develop so that we have more teachers in there, special education teachers in those inclusive roles. Um, and if you have any other questions, let me answer them for you, please. Ask them away. Does anyone have any questions? I don't. Nope. I wish I could talk to you all the time. Thank you. Thank you. I thank you for all your hard work. Mrs. Dupre's hard work. If you have any questions, email them. Yeah. Jay Phelan. That's it. I'll get them out to you. Yes, dot net. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Thanks, guys. I thank you for everyone's hard work. I know you work hard every day. Thank you. Um, and on that note, on Superintendent Legault's note, which I had planned to do this, and now it just bring, just hits it home. I would like to take action the action item about the Central School and Gordon W. Mitchell School uh, Student Parent Handbook. The action item. I would like to take that and move it up to the top of the action item so that we. Get that done. Oh, there's poor people the sitting here all night. The action item section. We love to see it, okay. <clears throat> so I'm doing it out of order. Um, have you all had a chance to look at the. I'll make a motion to approve. There's no other. Hold on. I had one little <laughs> edit I was going to ask about. Um, hold on. Sorry. Um, Central Elementary School, Middle School. Can we check it out to Mitchell School? I know that's minute, but. Yeah, on the front page. Sorry. What was the question one more time? On the front page it says middle school, and I know we changed the name of the school to the Mitchell School. Oh, yes. So. I think that was in his, um, that was in Mr. Gentile's thing that everywhere the... Um, no, the central school. Yeah, but it's on the central school. Oh, 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 I see, okay. The address. Right. Thank you. Nice so on that, and these are the only ones, there's no other <laughs> changes. No other changes. I didn't have any. I'm going to assume. Um, so on that note, I would take a motion to approve the recommended changes to the Central School and Gordon W. Mitchell School for the FY20 Student Parent Handbook. So moved. Second. Moved by Teresa, second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And I would take a motion to approve the school committee meeting minutes from May 9th and May 23rd, 2019. So moved. I'll second, but I have to abstain from May 9th. Right. So let's do them separately. So I take a motion from, um, make a motion for our school committee meeting minutes, approving them from May 9th, 2019. So moved. Second. Moved by Tim, second by Rob. Did I get that right? So you sound the same. I um, Sure. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. No, I couldn't tell who was who. Um, and I would take a motion to approve the school committee meeting minutes from May 23rd, 2019. So moved. 
Second. <laughs> that, that, that was a triple tie. Was I know who Teresa was. So moved by Teresa, second by? Second. Rob, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. So Gordon abstained and Tim abstained? Okay, thank you. And I would take a motion to approve um, accounts payable warrant 50V dated June 5th, 2019. So, so moved. moved. Moved by Gordon, second. Teresa, uh, second. By Teresa, all in favor? I don't even know anymore, I'm tired. Aye. 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 And at this time, I would take a motion to approve 49 PS dated 5-29-2019. So moved. Second. second. Moved by Gordon, second by Tim. All sure. in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and I was going, I'm going to take this, uh, the diploma thing and put it last because we might be talking about that. So the next item, I'm moving to the next item after the diploma discussion. Uh, I would like to read something before we <clears throat> take any action. So. The attorney-client privilege belongs to the school committee as a body and not to any individual member. The attorney cannot waive the privilege without the committee's authorization. The committee can always decide to waive its privilege as a body if it decides it wants to do so. No individual member can waive the privilege, however. It would be a violation of the conflict of interest law um, that would be chapter 268A, section 23C, number two, for an individual member to disclose information received by him or her as a member of the committee, which is protected by the attorney-client privilege. So, on that note. So, so before we move to that, can I make a motion? That, sure. That I'd like to make a motion that we, um, we move to waive the attorney client privilege regarding this matter as we were recently advised so we can have an open discussion about this this measure okay. moved by rob second by teresa oh, all which down. which, okay, which topic are you talking about it's the attorney client privilege. so I, 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 I'm, I'm moving to waive attorney our, our privilege right now so we can discuss how we were advised about this measure you're talking about article 11. correct okay so, i just want to make sure so okay moved by tim second by teresa all in favor aye, aye. I'm, I'm not in favor of that because usually the attorneys recommend not to go against their attorney client privilege. So I don't know if our one of our school committee attorneys wants to weigh in on. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't actually vote on that one yet. I'd like so to hear from the attorneys rather than. <coughs> say that again. So he cannot give us advice during open session. Oh. But, but, but it's usually, I spoke to, I spoke to Mr. F attorney Foskett today, and I also spoke to um, Nick Dominello, our attorney, sitting right beside me today, and it's not recommended. Even, both attorneys recommended, it's not recommended to um, go against the attorney-client privilege. So just so that's out there. I think on well, so matters, I would agree, but I, agree. But I don't oh. think that, that this particular matter, the just my opinion i don't i don't think it's a big deal to have an well, open discussion on it well with regard to article 11 when and under what circumstances can we discuss it right right so if, if, if it's if it's not here about it where is it right yeah so we either do we have to have an executive session it's it not doesn't it. fall under i asked category. about that too it doesn't fall under executive session either. so we we'll, <laughs> to tim's point i i agree that we have to i I'm not going to vote on anything that I haven't had the chance to discuss with the rest of the committee to get. I know my thoughts, but I, as a committee, the strength comes from the diverse opinions that we all sit around the table with. So I'd like to hear it. So I don't know how we get around that. These guys don't go. I, I would agree that on most matters, I would, I, would under, I would follow through on our attorney's advice. I think in this matter, we, we, need, to, we need to talk about it. And there wasn't anything particularly sensitive in our attorney's advice that can't, I, I saw that couldn't be discussed, or at least that we can't talk about. So, Trista, you voted how? We, I, I don't know, I didn't catch everybody. Yeah, vote. no, I, I, I voted in favor too. Um, I know how I'm gonna vote, um, but I read it again before coming to the meeting, and I, I just think as, because it's a collective vote, we do need to be able to discuss it. I mean, I know how I'm gonna vote. That's not the question, but I think we, there needs to be a little bit of a collaborative discussion so we can say we discussed it and didn't vote as a whole. I mean, we all read it, right? We all. So you said yes, Gordon? I would say yes, discuss it. Okay, and I say no because I like to go with what the lawyer says. Yes, discuss it. Rob? Still thinking. <laughs> um, I say yes. 
You got it. You got four. Really? Well, I think you have enough. I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to say yes, but it doesn't matter because I think we have enough votes. Okay, so open for discussion. It's irrelevant how I. Vote. So it only I would only clarify, and you can make this motion just that you're only waiving attorney-client privilege for this narrow. Yes. Yes. Just to discuss this one thing, yes. not understood. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. I was thinking about the slippery slope argument. So, if I could just add a comment, I don't have much to say, but I just have one comment I wanted to make. Um, there is, I, I did some asking around, and there is a process when town bylaws are amended by which the Attorney General's office um, takes those bylaws under advisement and researches if those bylaw adjustments are in violation of the U.S. state constitutions, local laws, uh, conflicts of interest, um, conflicting with other town bylaws, so on and so forth. And I know that our attorney's advice mentioned that there could be conflicts, but I, I, I feel that regardless of what, how we feel about this and regardless of whether it passes town meetings, that's the process the state has for amending bylaws. And to say that it could be a conflict of interest isn't <coughs> reason enough for me to say vote against this. There's a process in place to decide if there's a conflict. So regardless of whether we think it's a good idea or not, the process is in place and, and that should be allowed to happen if, if, if it passes through. Uh, make myself um, clear on that? You said exactly what I, what I would have said. The AG will reject anything that is in violation of law. Um, Regardless of whether we think it's a good we're idea. We're not talking right. about whether it's legal or not. We're talking about whether or not we're going to recommend it or not. Right. Mm -hmm. but well, there's, there's however, really, the, really the, clear the, the privilege that we just we're made not, was yeah. relative to whether or not there could be a potential conflict and the attorney. But, but, but where, I think the, the article on the um, agenda is whether or not we recommend it as a body. Not, we're not, we're not well, here, the outcome we're not, of the we're not is here telling to, us, <coughs> telling us that finish, we don't please? favor. <clears throat> we're not here to argue whether or not it's legal or not, whether it's constitutional or not. We're here to, to say whether or not we agree but or I, disagree. I think Tim's our, our point Our legal advice was, was that it, it might not be, and therefore we should vote against it. And that could be one of the arguments that right. mm -hmm. you, you people could make. Well, I think that to, was the argument. Yeah, well, there are several points. Whether, whether or not we're going to vote for the body. To recommend or not recommend. The second point that was brought up was that there, uh, the town administrator historically has pegged the school district to a set percentage, and that's frustrating to try to build a budget when not understanding the needs of the district, and that a new town administrator may be more open. We don't know who the next town administrator is going to be, and I, I don't want to take a guess that that town administrator is suddenly going to find money for us that we didn't have before. I would hope that one would, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I, I think to suppose that someone in the future is going to be more workable with the school system is, again, not a reason to vote or not vote for mm -hmm. a bylaw amendment. I think that the, the point that was brought up in the attorney's le letter, which has bothered me for a while, <clears throat> and that is, it doesn't matter which part of the equation or which part of the argument you're on, whether you're, you're on the part that says, hey, the schools should be able to vote whatever they vote and that's the money, or on the town side, which says, hey, we don't have any money, so what are you spending it for, kind of thing. The, the, the point he brought up was that it's highly unusual that you get the town meeting and there hasn't been an agreement between us and the town that says, we can do this, or if you're gonna push this through, we'll make these adjustments, because that, always, that was always the point that I was trying to wonder, at the town meeting, if we voted yay or nay, or the town voted more or less, whatever, that the town administrator is sitting there saying, now what do I do? Well, <laughs> you voted another $100,000. Right. Everything else is balanced. Now how am I going to, and then I, my understanding is you can't leave town meeting until that gets resolved. Well, so then, then there has to be the discussion of where we're going to get that 100000 whatever the number what is. What did it happen two years? Was it last year or the year before? It doesn't, doesn't matter. Was it last year? It doesn't matter when it happened. No, but it, it has right. happened. <laughs> right. No, but I'm telling you, yeah. it has happened. Yeah, he's, um, right. But he's, right. But he's, so but he's to, right. Me, to me, that's the bigger point, is we need to have a working relationship with the town that this gets resolved one way or the other before it gets to the floor of the town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and it, the other point I was confused with is that he said there could be you know, uh, conflicts or violations in here, but I, I don't think he elaborated on it, so I, I don't know where they are. I mean, it makes sense to me what's written here, but I'm not a lawyer, and so, but I respect the fact that a lawyer reviewed it and said, uh, you, hold on, there might be a problem with this. 
So I, I want to be respectful of that. And I, my understanding is our vote is simply, this gets voted on the floor of the town, right. town hall, town meeting. Um, and our vote tonight would just be to say, hey, we want to go on record as saying we don't support this. Is I'm that mean they're going to read, because as they, in, in right. town well, meetings, they read whether the, the governing body for that department endorsed or not endorsed the bylaw proposal? Correct. So they would say school committee endorsed or not endorsed. John, that, John, that's how that happens, correct? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. The moderator does that, right? right. Yeah. yeah. When he reads the word. He does, yep. Yeah. He'll say FinCom recommends, uh, yeah. school committee recommends, doesn't recommend. But this is unusual because, well, I, I guess not. Yeah. The fact that it comes from the petition. True. That's, that's the point. Right. This is by petition. Right. Okay. So I don't know that we even need to state an opinion on it. I mean, I know when we you don't. Well, see, opponent. so we don't. We we can decide not to have an have an opinion as a body. We can decide that. It's up to it's up to you guys. Well, at a minimum, if we're going to make any decision, I'd like to at least amend the language to rather than say to vote publicly that we do not support it. To to say have it say we would decide whether to support or not support petitioned Article Eleven, and then continue with the rest of that language. That, that doesn't give us the right to vote yes, or that we support it or not we, support we, we it. We can Just, vote what, however right. we would like. We can change the and if all this is in a moot point in five minutes when four people vote no, then so be it. But I just want to make sure that. So you want to say um, to vote to vote to state publicly I would, that it we're going to vote not. Thing, we're going to change I would move language, support I would, or not support. I would move that the uh, I would I, I would make a motion that the the votable item is that the committee will decide whether to support or not support petitioned article 11 which seeks to amend the town's bylaws requiring the process for voting on the school committee's budget and to forward the town a statement of endorsement or non-endorsement okay Did you write that so down? i can write i that wrote, down. I can write I wrote that down well i have here i have um because i just wrote or not support support or not support so i just changed it to say um actions required for the school committee to vote to state publicly that it does support or not support petition article 11 mm -hmm. blah 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 with the rest and then at the end instead of saying it's statement of no endorsement it says in statement of endorsement or non-endorsement depending on which way it's statement of no endorsement or say that or again endorsement or no endorsement it's three three then we're not making a statement then it fails right yeah. well no then we make no statement mm -hmm. right So, well, I, I don't know what the protocol is. Yeah, we I mean, public well, comments. right now like, we already had the public comment section, so we can't really have. The, I mean, like. Why is that? Why can't a person speak oh to a particular article? I, don't oh boy, Rob, it's a legitimate Sorry. question okay. because it happens at selectmen's meetings. It happened at finance. Well, there was a woman meetings. who started to speak earlier, and I, we we said. That I thanked her for her. I appreciated her comments. That we have our public comment section now. I understand, so but I'm, this I'm is asking our school why committee is that meeting in public. It. It's parliamentary our, procedure. Right. It's our school committee meeting in public. Parliamentary so, procedure that you selectively enforce. No. Yes. No. I would not. not I would not. On this road. But I'm not arguing about it. So. Um, but we could so, win so that. So Rob, you made the motion to to change this uh, um, action item. So. Rob voted to, Rob made, excuse me, Rob made the motion to, to change That's this action item. So, I mean, excuse me, sorry. Tim made the motion to change this action item. So I'm going to say you made the motion. So Tim made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Teresa. All in favor to change this um, action item to read, action is required for the school committee to vote to state publicly that it does support or not support petition article 11, which seeks to amend the town's bylaws requiring the process for voting on the school committee's budget and to forward to the town its statement of endorsement or no endorsement. So, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and at this time, I would take a motion to um, <clears throat> move the school committee to vote to state publicly that it does support or not support Article 11, which seeks to amend the town's bylaws requiring the process for voting on the school committee's budget and to forward to the town its statement of endorsement or no endorsement. Moved. Moved by, was that you, Tim? Yes. You guys sound a lot alike. Moved by Tim. <laughs> Moved. Wait a minute, 
even, I don't know, I don't know what I'm voting. Yeah, but are we so voting this, to this, say this, yes? This is the motion that we just re right, 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 so we'll start with Teresa. What, I'm We're going to say endorse or not endorse. So if you endorse, you want the you want this motion to be endorsed for the town meeting. You want the school committee to say to we the town it. that we support the Article 11 on the warrant. Or you could say support or not, it's support, right? Is support that, or not support. Right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I say we endorse it just for the purposes of discussion at town meeting. I think the town meeting is going to happen and we're going to discuss it regardless so I'm going to say I do not endorse this. I don't think it's necessary. Endorse. So we have a endorse. Endorse. Not endorse. Not endorse. 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 So you're endorsing. Okay. No, it's Hold on. Make it just, <laughs> we're endorsing. Don't make yourself get. <laughs> okay. We're in support of article. Okay. So Tim and Teresa want it. Support. Trista, you want to go Gordon's thinking? I do not endorse. So that's a no, 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 and two yeses so far. I'm going to say no, I don't endorse. However, not that it matters once I vote that way, but it's, it's, I, I agree with the concept that's here. My concern is what are the legalities and, and the fact that we don't have a town administrator in place. I'd like to think we could come to this this to me seems reasonable that we could make this happen with a town administrator and, and make this process finally make sense. But so I'd, I'd say no, not endorse. So that's a four to two. We're going to issue a statement that the school committee does not endorse the motion. Yeah. But we're going to have a discussion anyway. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Well, it's going to be a town meeting, right? Well, thank you for getting through that. Um, Let's fun. see. Not really. <laughs> Up sure. next, we have. Um, I would require. I mean, I would accept the. I would take a motion to accept the donation, the generous donation of seventy-five dollars from Amica Companies Foundation to Mrs. McGovern's classroom for supplies. So, so moved. Moved by Rob. Second. Okay. Second by Trista. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And um, so we did that one. And the last but not least. Um, I would take a motion after discussion uh, regarding the distribution of diplomas at graduation. So I would take a motion to, I don't know, that's not even written. I don't, um, just, we need to discuss distribution of diplomas on gradu at, at graduation and decide how, how we feel they should be distributed and by whom, as opposed to, huh? we're uh, like, this has been brought a few times. Again, it is a very important date. I think past school committee members and school committee members, administration, and if you deem so, if a, if a teacher is asked to come forward by a student in a, in a written form like what was done at this last graduation, I, I, can, I can handle that. When you go outside your school world or you go outside administration or school committee, you're, that's where you're opening this up to. I think, you know, we had a, I even spoke to the mother who asked if she could give her diploma. I don't think she was upset. I don't think she was hurt. I think she said, I saw someone else do it a couple of years ago. Let me see if I can give my daughter her grad." And she was so proud of her daughter because when it comes to graduation, that's what you're there for. You want to watch your son or daughter walk across stage. This is what you do. These long nights, these tough questions, these hard things that you have to go through, this is why you're here. This is why you make these decisions. They're not easy. I mean, I personally have, have never felt that even as a school committee that I am worthy. Right. Didn't I definitely think right. worthy is probably a good well, I definitely I think the like principals need to be out there. An educator yes. thing. We did. Well, we, we didn't, didn't we go into detail. And there was but I just think that I would just think that we never <clears> you would keep it there. And I, I don't know if you need policy on it or... I think that it's an advisement of the school committee that the school committee delivers 
the diplomas along with the school's administration. And if the child, if a student of the graduating class writes a written letter that would like to have a teacher from any grade that they've had throughout the district, that it comes before you by May 1st <laughs> and you decide on it, that, that it could be Mary, it could be Sandy Tellis from kindergarten, it could be Kate Byrne from Central, it could be Andrew Gentile. So we talked about this like a month ago, and I remember, I remember, I know we didn't vote it, but I remember saying the only stipulation was that we wanted to say East Bridge Water School Committee yeah. so that someone from Abington didn't right. say. Right. So I think is the still question ongoing? is should we actually have a documented policy? Or is this just going to live on in discussion, right? Like, I think yeah. it should just be advisement because there's going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, the president. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but let's pick someone else. Um, <laughs> the education secretary. The governor calls up and says, you know, because sometimes they do that. They just, you know, or the secretary of state calls up and says, I would like to come to your graduation. Well, you can't because we've. The right. policy over here, right. you know, but if it's under advisement, we could say we would love to have you, secretary. And he, they come in for five minutes. I'm gonna, you know, mm -hmm. see a couple people. I, I just think an advisement, mm -hmm. an advisory. Uh, I, I, so I think. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was, I, I was just gonna add. I think f for future uh, school committee members, uh, ourselves included, and whoever takes our place, is that. Uh, I, I think some outline available, perhaps not all the way to policy, but some outline as a, as a, as a guidance to say, hey, because you want to be consistent, you want to have a thought process behind it. So I'm all for we take it under advisement given these criteria, great. And whether it's just a note in the, in the minutes or what, I, I, I think that would suffice. I agree with that. I, yeah, I agree. The yeah. school committee, we have an opportunity to, um, if nothing else, provide cover for you. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe 20 years from now, your successor. Uh, um, that it, it doesn't just rely on you. Because right. people can't say, oh, well, you know, uh, this person gets favoritism, this person right. doesn't. That the, the committee can provide cover, political cover. Sure. I, I, I think that's fair and reasonable. We can talk about advisement and yeah. you know, bring it to the committee and say, hey, the folks who showed up on May 1st and had a written letter and brought it in and these are my recommendations and we just say okay great so if it doesn't live in policy I don't know if we have a memo of understanding I, I don't know I don't know we where have, it would I, I would we go have to operating policy. protocols operating okay. protocols that's good yes so you have a recommendation okay. on this stuff I'm sure every district has a different every district yeah. does it differently every yeah I think I, under the I, I, I talked to my kid I said hey do you want me to give you a diploma and he said I don't I don't want you to go to my graduation <laughs> <laughs> um, I would yeah I would say under our operating protocol, that's fine. That's an advisement, yeah. That's fine. So do we, yeah. I think it's best to do it that way because then who's ever here, whether it's the six of you or the or another six, allow them to whatever, yeah. they, you know. Do what they want. Okay. Add it to our operating protocol. So do you want to just vote to add it to our operating protocol and. I mean, we'll have to draft it. To, okay, so yeah. we're going to end up bringing this back to another. Um, cool. I'm so sick of getting a dead <laughs> horse. Why don't we just start talking about graduation 2020? Yeah. That's <laughs> <so advisable. laughs> right. so, so we'll have to draft what, what it's going to say. Okay. And then we're into that. Yep. Mm -hmm. and, um, Thank you. Can, can, um, yep, at this time I would I, take a motion. I'm going to table that and bring come up with some kind of draft on that, uh, uh, our, the action item. And at this time I would take a motion to adjourn. But can I have second. discussion before we do that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Really? Only a second. No, no, no. Not discussing that we're going to end the meeting. Maybe he's going to end it. <laughs> Is that what, what occurred to me tonight as everything unfolded is it, I really want to focus on the positive. And even though there were dissension, people feel strongly about the schedule or, or about different things uh, that were discussed today, it, it's, it's such a great energy to have passion. I'd like it idealistically, everything to be focused on the positive, can't always be that way. But anybody who would look at what happened tonight and you see dedicated educators and administrators who spent decades working in the school system and have such eloquent words about the process. You listen to a student coming out of you know, the, the audience to talk about uh, what's happening at the school. Another student comes forward who organized a protest 
uh, whether you agree or disagree with the protests, that's all impressive stuff. The teachers, the, the other people who are here who had passion about around the subject matter. Um, I, I, I think back to a couple of meetings ago when some parent came forward and said, I want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Man, that's, that's the way to do it. And if lots of people in the town are not so connected to the schools because either the kids have graduated, they don't have kids or whatever, you watch tonight's meeting and say, wow, there's stuff happening here. I mean, I hope we can all get it resolved. People aren't always going to agree with whichever path we go. But to just see the, the passion, the involvement, the effort that it takes to make all this happen, then you listen to, as Ms. Legault said, you know, the, the teachers uh, and administrators who are involved in making this strategy work, uh, our strategic plan, uh, the leadership, it, it just, it, to me, it's just so impressive, and I'd much prefer to focus on the positive. I know there'd be disagreements. I know there's still going to be problems to have to be resolved. So be it. But man, keep, keep that focus on <laughs> people care about what's going on. That you can, that's always can be a good thing, I, I think. Anyway, so just, it just occurred to me. Sorry, sorry to keep you here even longer. Thank you for those sentiments, Gordon. <laughs> okay. I have to say, Thank you, I would like to just, um, Thank you. I would like to say respectfully that I care. I care about everything that goes on in these schools, and I care about what happens with our kids and their education. And I take it very seriously, and it's a very important subject. I don't think, I don't think you sit at this table without not caring. But it's not, it's not for the pay. No, because we don't uh, get any. When do we get that? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Never. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt the whole process of adjourning the meeting. Sorry. Thank you, Gordon. We, well, I like to end the meeting on a nice note. Those were good sentiments. Well, okay. Um, at this time, I would take a motion to adjourn our meeting. Second. Moved by Teresa, second by Tim. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. 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 Good night, everyb